attract the revenue that's associated competition and comparison to uh, Bitcoin scalable issues. And uh, this is also review the fact. And uh, I would like to map the, some process to Bitcoin issues. And I would like to explain the similarity and the differences. And next, so I would like to shortly explain other experience in transition of technology. Uh, I, we had uh, some practice on transition. So I think that uh, we had a similar situation as hash function in 2004. So currently used technology has some uh, drawbacks. Uh, this is a general event on many technologies. And we should now revisit if the current technology is trust trustable and stable. And the question is that uh, the current technology is good enough for long-term use? Uh, we, and uh, with considering advance of technology and change of application. So I would like to show the so, uh, abstract of the history of SHA-3 competition. In 2004, we faced a compromise of standard hash function, including MD5, RIPE, MD, SHA-0, and SHA-1. Uh, I would like to note that uh, SHA-2 is still secure. And after that, so we decided that to develop a new hash function in 2005. So at that time, so we uh, tried to uh, create a new future uh, alternative to SHA-2. And we decided to open competition by international researchers. And uh, this was the same as AES competition. And uh, I think that uh, uh, that competition was succeeded in making technology consensus uh, by its careful process. So I would like to explain that the problem we faced at, uh, in 2004. So this slide shows that uh, cryptographic definition of hash functions. We have three uh, definitions, primary resistant, second primary resistant, and collision resistant. And so if the, so some hash function uh, do not fulfill the second primary resistant characteristics, uh, it results forgery of data signature and hash change. And uh, in 2004, it is pointed out that MD5, FMD, and SHA-0 is not cohesion resistant. This is a, a start point of the SHA-3 competition. And so there are, are the many so, intentions uh, to initiate the competition by NIST and cryptographers. So I, uh, they so believe that the competition promotes the research on hash function. So that was the same as uh, AES competition. So at that time, so at the so AES competition, we so obtained much research results and knowledge from the competition of, uh, from the uh, competition on block ciphers. And at that time, so we didn't have sufficient knowledge on secure hash function. So. Uh, uh, we had another intention that uh, so even if the SHA-1 was compromised, NIST had SHA-2 as an alternative of the SHA-1. However, so SHA-2 has a similar structure as SHA-1. This is so called Mark Dangard construction. So uh, at that time, so they thought that uh, so it's a good time to initiate a uh, uh, competition. And so we needed that uh, to consider another option at that time. So we had three major steps in the SHA-3 competition. Uh, after the com compromise of standard hash function found in 2004, we had the preparation phase at, at first. And after that, so we uh, NIST uh, published the Federal Register for the, the, the competition itself. And uh, after that, uh, we had uh, several uh, evaluation the selection phase for SHA-3 hash function. After that, so we had a winner, Kechak, in 2012. At the first workshop in the preparation phase, we uh, identified the problem in hash function. After that, we had uh, extensive discussions in the mailing list. In the second workshop, we discussed on technical requirements of on future hash function. I think that uh, this, this uh, green box is quite similar to uh, this series of Bitcoin scalability workshops. So in the third phase of the, this competition, uh, the most uh, selection process uh, was uh, based on the academic papers. 
And so at first, NIST selects uh, some uh, several so candidates by screening screening process. After that, so at the first conference held in 2009, so uh, so there are many presentations of 51 candidates for the technical details. After that, uh, NIST selects uh, 14 candidates for second round. Uh, at the uh, second conference held in 2010, so we had uh, extensive security and performance evaluation at that time. And so after that, so NIST selects five finalists. And the, at the third conference held in 2012, so we continued evaluation on security and performance. We also considered about uh, so how the finalist is uh, uh, complement SHA-2. And uh, NIST has a strong philosophy in the SHA-3 competition. The first is open and public discussions. So in, they have uh, such kind of discussions in setting technical requirements and security and performance evaluation. And it is so done using the mailing list and the wiki. And so they screen that uh, they select the technologies uh, with security evaluation first. Then they say they uh, select a uh, fewer number of technologies by using performance evaluation. And so and so they had as a comp uh, uh, ma uh, much cooperation with. So academic com communities, uh, and they you refer the so peer-reviewed papers as evidence of selection. And so NIST Shastri conferences were co-located with top conferences. Uh, this is uh, so good uh, evidence. Uh, there were uh, so many uh, cooperation with academic community. And so requirements and evaluation criteria were uh, consistently given by NIST. So Lesson learned uh, uh, from this uh, slide is uh, so we already have good uh, open public discussions in the mailing list, and so we uh, need some more cooperation with academic communities, and so and we should have uh, some kind of sort of uh, written requirements and evaluation criteria. I think that this, this is uh, so discussed in this workshop and after the workshop in the mailing list. And so I think that the uh, research so, uh, journal will help our so activities. And uh, in the work first workshop of the preparation phase, we discussed three issues. Uh, one is a study on, a study on attacks. So we reviewed the, so the recent attack on hash function, not limited to SHA-1. And so we reviewed also SHA-2, security of SHA-2 and the impact. And the second is how to migrate to the uh, uh, how, how to migrate. So we discussed a short short term workaround that could we continue to use Shellbank, uh, so benefit and cost for tra transition to the next technology. And so we also discussed about uh, needed uh, research topics. And so I would like to suggest that uh, at this workshop, uh, I uh, we should identify the problem and the research item and the way for migration. So after that, so in the mailing list discussion, uh, NIST collects any technical information and opinions, including and, uh, more analysis on, on this problem, so, such as uh, some more attacks on existing hash, uh, ex sorry. Sorry, and so as it is not related to SHA-1 or other standard hash, and new technologies uh, uh, included, including the newly proposed hash function, so design theory and methodology, and so they also exploring so uh, requirements uh, with analysis of application and operational environment. So I would like to suggest that uh, we should continue discussion on the requirement and technologies in the mailing list. And in the second workshop, sir, we discussed uh, two kinds of issues. Uh, one is a more study about uh, so security of hash function and the requirements. And we sh also discussed on the design theory of new hash function and the recent attacks and the deep analysis of application. And for competition, 
there are two major questions. One is uh, so we should select the one general function, hash fun function or several specific hash functions. This is a major problem. And the other question is uh, so how we design the next hash function. And after that, uh, after this uh, workshop, NIST, uh, NIST and uh, this community decided that uh, uh, because SHA2 has a similar structure as SHA1, the committee directed to initiate a compression. So I would like to say that uh, uh, I should move to technical review for the next technology and we uh, need some requirements. Uh, uh, but uh, some requirements are so already discussed in the mailing list. Uh, so we should build consensus on firm requirements, evaluation criteria, evaluation platform, target application, and platform in the second workshop in Hong Kong. And in the Federal Register, NIST uh, proposed uh, uh, technical requirements on the SHA-3, uh, including a tunable parameter, uh, which covers the trade-off between the security and performance. And they also show the so clearly target application of hash function, including the signature, MAC, key, uh, KDF, and uh, uh, random bit generator. And uh, we, I would like to say that uh, we should issue an agreed document on requirements. And in uh, the evaluation uh, process of round one, so uh, NIST screen by application document to 51. And so in that round, NIST uh, mainly focus on the security evaluation of 51. And with cooperation with academic uh, conferences, and the, the result of the security evaluation uh, was aggregated into the SHA3. SHA3 is a wiki site uh, which collects uh, uh, the current status of security of each hash function. And I would like to suggest that uh, again that uh, the cooperation with academic community is good, uh, is good. And so we should build an open repository for security and stability evaluation. In round two, NIST uh, allowed so each applicant uh, to, uh, to make some kind of tweaks. And so NIST and the community made a more security analysis. But so evaluation uh, interest moved to performance. So NIST and the community set the common evaluation environment for hardware and software and uh, many so researchers opened a source code for evaluation and provide, provide them the public verifiable. And eBash project corrects the res uh, res uh, result of performance evaluation and publish it uh, publish by using the website. And NIST corrects performance evaluation data through this process. Then uh, NIST selected five finalists. In the round three, uh, small amount of tweak was allowed, so, and uh, rigorous analysis of security margin was made, and performance evaluation for possible application and platform was made, and uh, uh, they also uh, think thought about uh, the complementing SHA2 with SHA3. And Ketchak was selected uh, because that uh, Ketchak has enough security of perfor and performance for possible applications and platforms, and they have diversity of design. Uh, they uh, have also not MD construction, but they use a sponge-based construction. So attacks on SHA-1 and SHA-2 are not applied to Ketchak. So my, I would like suggest that uh, so if we have fewer technical op options. We have uh, 51 options in SHA-3, but uh, if we have fewer technical options, we can merge round two and round three. And uh, the process can down through the mailing list and open repository. And so we can prepare uh, performance evaluation easily. So we, ha we already done such kind of evaluation. And uh, confirmation security and stability fast, then evaluate performance is a good, uh, good process for uh, to, to make a consensus. And two, uh, the one uh, remains the question is, uh, so we should consider long-term stability and technology, technological diversity. This is the one question. And so I uh, so note that the organization of this competition. 
we have NIST and hash designer and the cryptographer and evaluators. And NIST so holds uh, several conferences and so th uh, they organize the open mailing list. And we have the academic communities and conferences, the Shasuizu with uh, rigorous peer reviewed papers. And so hash designer and so evaluator send some kind of technical document to academic communities and NIST. And so NIST conference refers as an academic conference, the result of academic conference. And so NIST also refer uh, result from both uh, conferences. And uh, NIST organizes a whole process and the conferences, uh, the set requirements and the selec selection and decision. And the problem is, and uh, this was uh, discussed yesterday, we don't have NIST uh, in this issue and in this community. Uh, this workshop and follow-up follow, uh, follow discussion in the mailing list act the same role, but uh, we need some um, neutral committee here. And we, uh, I would like to conclude a good practice from Shastri. We uh, open discussion on the public verifiability a key to fairness. And so uh, firm requirements, evaluation criteria, evaluation platform and target platform and application should be defined. And the cooperation with academic community is important. And so aiming design diversity is good for long-term uh, stability. I would look at a short explanation of my experience in hash function, that's a transition. So in general, cryptography is not perfect. And in some application of correct cryptography, changing underlying technology is not so easy. For example, so data signature data is accessed for a long time. And we should change also data itself by changing hash function or key, key, uh, key size itself. And the transition plan is needed for technology uh, change. And the NIST published transition plan for changing hash, ciphers, and data signature in SP 800-131A. Uh, there, there was a three years margin for changes, so change uh, technologies. But uh, I think that uh, scaling Bitcoin tra uh, tra uh, transaction is different problem from hash function. I think that it's easier to solve than uh, hash problem. So I would like to conclude my talks. Uh, firm requirements, open discussion, the public verifiability, fair and consistent evaluation platform, and cooperation is a keys of the success in the Shastri competition. And I uh, explain the detail of the competition and map the process and practice in Bitcoin issues. Thank you. Thank you, Matsuo-san. An excellent start to the morning. SHA-3 and IST competition review. Now, next up will be objective functions in Bitcoin development by uh, Mr. Paul Stortz. I, I know Paul from reading some of his writings on Truthcoin. You were the author, correct, Paul? Correct. Exactly. And uh, which, of course, uh, is a pretty amazing, some good stuff. And Yale, right? Somewhere around there? All right, good. So um, this should be great. So OK, some more people came in. So while Paul is getting ready, uh, those new people who came in, how are you feeling today? OK, wait, 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 wait. <laughs> Why do I? You guys always put me through this agonizing process where I have to call you guys out to tell me, good morning. Good morning. Uh, chorus, good morning. OK, we're not in tune. Good morning. Awesome. All right. Woo. And today we are. OK. All right. Today we are anti-fragile. All right. You guys sound fragile. Don't, don't sound anti-fragile. All right. Paul, are you ready? Paul Stortz, Objective Functions. Thank you. Welcome. Give Paul it up. Welcome, Paul. Yeah. Thank you. I'm going to talk about three different things. They're all related. I'm really just going to mention the first two and then get into this, this third one. So the first and most important thing is sort of some like emergency discourse kind of repair type concept. So um, an objective function is something that you want to achieve. So if you don't agree on that first, um, the conversation is 
a waste of time after that. So I think uh, there are a lot of people here. You know, this is a very uh, diverse community. Some people are interested in cheap transactions. Other people want to like single-handedly overthrow most of the world's governments. Uh, some people want to like timestamp documents. So if you if you can't agree on what you know the objective is, everything you could say after that might be true, and you could still get a different conclusion, and everything would be uh, a disaster. So I just wanted to mention this in two slides. This is the second one, and uh, so related to the block size, if you um, if someone hasn't stated what they think the block size does for Bitcoin, then you can't even tell if what they said is related to improving Bitcoin, according to them, let alone whether you even care if they, what they said was right because you even agree with the purpose that they expressed. So secondly, if, you, if you're gonna state conditions under which the block size should increase, you should also be able to say, state conditions under which uh, it should decrease they're actually the same question because either it's related fundamentally to some principle or it's just kind of like what you think today and tomorrow it could be something else or if you went to a different person, they could think something else. So that's, I just want, I really wanted to mention that because I think a lot of misery, and I hope it's not too patronizing because you know professional philosophers struggle with this kind of reduction to first principles a lot and I think a lot of misery has basically been the result of this and, and nothing else. So I also wanted to briefly mention something that I wrote uh, a blog post about very recently. Uh, so not agreeing on the objective function is almost as bad as not agreeing on uh, the constraint. So decentralization is something that I think we would all agree is sort of this constraint and we need to keep it at some acceptable level. Uh, so I don't really actually wanna go into this because there's not a lot of time, but basically my conclusion is that if you uh, you need to run a full node in order to know whether or not you've been paid or you're asking someone else if, they, if you've been paid, and so you have to trust them. So the, this process of using money becomes more decentralized when it's easier and cheaper to run a full node. Uh, and I think, so this is like the scalability comment I wanted to make, is that I think that since uh, it's an engineering requirement that Bitcoin be kind of above the law, so it's not like you don't have to want to break the law or anything, but if you acknowledge the law as an authority, it is no longer peer-to-peer. -peer. So everything that's peer-to-peer BitTorrent, Bitcoin, whatever, um, it all is above the law just by design. So it's not like, it doesn't have to mean anything politically. Uh, but my point is that I think the real constraint is actually not uh, upstream bandwidth, but I think it's actually Tor bandwidth so that things remain private. And I think it would be very cool if someone could figure out how to do metering of the bandwidth using Bitcoin itself. And with that being the case, you would have an actual price for this bandwidth, and that would be the last abstract thing, and you could add them all up, and then you'd have an actual number for measuring decentralization. But since this is part of the communication block, and I really have something important to say about this concept of peer-to-peer -peer governance, so I think we can all agree that governance is more important, or at least it affects the software. The causality kind of like goes up through this pyramid, uh, the governance is the only thing that can change the protocol's rules, and so it's actually even more important than the operation of the protocol or the software that uses the protocol. It's sort of, it's, it's more important. Um, it's really, really difficult to figure out how to do this and how to communicate this information, you know, given that everyone is going to be an equal peer. Uh, and I really think that no one has ever done this before because even something else that's peer-to-peer, -peer, like um, BitTorrent, it doesn't really matter if you fork BitTorrent and you create a new BitTorrent client, it doesn't affect the people who are already using their old BitTorrent client at all. Uh, so it's like they're all soft forks when it comes to BitTorrent or basically anything else. But with money, it's a big deal because what other people do affects you. And so we're kind of like all in this together, whether we, we like it or not. So you need some kind of governance thing, yet with this peer-to-peer -peer thing, it's, it's gonna be very difficult. So, uh, so I'm suggesting that we can use markets to inform this governance process. So it's not like a government, like you don't like have to do this, but it's like what should the government do, governance? So uh, markets can help us inform this governance process a lot, I think. So first of all, they're totally peer-to-peer -to -peer and like permissionless and decentralized just in their nature because all the information happens locally. But what I really wanted to explain is that uh, markets transform subjective values into objective information. So 
That's a very helpful thing. When you, in capital markets, like the stock market, you make a trade, you have contributed knowledge to, to the market. So you think the current price is X, and you change it to Y, and you think that uh, you know, the X was wrong, and you think that Y is right. So, uh, but more importantly than this knowledge that you contribute, you know that anyone could, have, anyone could have changed the price to anything, but they did not. It's you who's changing it from X to Y. So you think that you're actually the number one expert in the entire world because anyone could have done this thing and picked up expected value and made some money and expectation, but they did not. And you are doing it instead. So it's like you're really saying that you're the expert. So this is kind of like a maximization of the signal to noise ratio in a way. And market prices are constantly and unanimously acceptable. So at all times, to all people, the, the price is an acceptable measure of future reality because if the you know if it's, if this is ever not the case someone can trade and introduce something that you know introduce an edit to the forecast that nets them money so but most important of all uh, the real purpose of all of this is that prices are what game theorists call common knowledge so if i know the price of something is k and you know that it's k i mean we can just look at whatever price we're, we're talking about and we'll all we'll both know that it's k and everyone will know that everyone knows that it's k and everyone will know that everyone knows that it's k ad infinitum etc so um it common knowledge enables something called free coordination so since everyone is on the same page it's very easy for a group of people to just switch from one thing to another thing even without any kind of leader being involved uh, so that's, uh, that's a really important thing. So I kind of think of it as uh, actually it's not sort of like, you know, you have these proofs in cryptography that you know like a certain number or something. But I see prices as kind of like an expertise proof. You can just look at them and everyone knows that this was an accumulation of a serious quantity of expertise. Uh, and so that uh, can be very helpful to us. And it's not commonly known that, you know, markets can be about anything. They don't need to be about capital. They can be about uh, these, these events, which are today commonly called prediction markets. Um, so you have these like partitions of mutually exclusive states. And so on the left here, one of these things is paying a dollar, only one of them, because Hillary Clinton is either going to be elected or not elected. Uh, and on the right, it's basically the same question. It's electoral college votes. In the United States, there's 538 electoral college votes for president. And you can just Instead of being, you know, it's like zero, one, you can just split this thing. So you can get a continuous uh, measure instead of a discrete one. So, uh, so this has some costs, even though it's only like an information thing. So what a cost that it does not have is you're not like sacrificing any of your autonomy or anything. You can still decide to ignore this later, but, um, but it does have some costs. And so the costs are like the, you need an oracle, you need this market infrastructure, and you need traders. And so as was mentioned, I, I have my own project, Truthcoin, aims to eliminate the oracle completely and make it peer-to-peer, uh, -peer, but it's highly experimental and requires peg side chains, which don't currently exist. So you could make a very, very, very simplified version instead, which is sort of what I'm proposing, um, with this federated idea, and you could have these multi-sig functionaries. So this is kind of like a trade-off, right? So I'm saying you're picking like something like seven people to just type in five or six numbers later. They need to type in you know, what the objective function ended up being. But they don't need to use any expertise or anything like that. They just type in something that we all know. And you're just trusting them to do it honestly. So this is a trade-off like anything else. So like, for example, the SHA-3 competition that we just heard about, you had to have experts kind of administer. That was like endorsed by like the federal government, and there was there was like a hierarchy of expertise and the experts were sort of in charge. Uh, but with this, you know, you don't have experts, you have these representatives who, um, you're only picking them based on how likely they are to do this job. So you're not, you're not saying they're smart or that you like them or anything, you just think that they're likely to type in these numbers honestly, possibly because they own Bitcoin businesses that would lose future business or something like that. So the problem with the experts thing is that it's a circular definition and this is a very, diverse community and it's like who's going to resolve a dispute if you think someone is an expert and someone is not. But it's much easier, it's much more objective to pick the representative. Um, the other thing is that there's this trade-off between meta deception and deception. So the expert, you might pick these seven people or these three in this case and they might deceive you, but you would know that you had been deceived because you, they had these numbers and they just typed in numbers that were different. So 
you would know that they deceived you. Whereas today, I think we're just kind of confused in general, and it's sort of like we don't know what we're confused about or who is, you know, who is actually more confident or more of an expert about what they, a certain thing, uh, than someone else. And so I, it's just a trade-off like anything else. But this is the bad news. Uh, so I don't really have a lot of time to go into this, but I think people, the, the other two things, so the market infrastructure is actually very, very, very easy. You don't need to do this thing with um, having everyone submit bids and asks into like a big order book and like waiting for them to overlap or something like that. You can actually have something called a market scoring rule, which just has a single state, and then a single person just atomically updates the state, and it's only them. So, you know, it's just like passing a single Bitcoin around, um, only faster. But the way this works is that there's this formula that you have these mutually exclusive states, and you have the formula that relates the total number of outstanding shares to an account of money that the market owns. And people propose updates to the share state. They, uh, if you want to buy shares, you propose an update that has more shares. If you want to sell, you propose an update that has lower shares. You do this on your own computer. It, you use this tiny formula. You can actually change the formula around a lot, but you use some formula to relate these things. And if you pay the difference, then it's valid. If you don't, it's, it's not valid. So you can buy, it issues the shares. You can do buying. You can do selling. Um, on the right, I have this first difference. So time is on this vertical axis. And on the right, I have this first difference. So this red guy at time equals 9 bought 18 shares for 1286 something. And then this green guy at time equals 12 bought, sold 21 shares of that right more right uh, state for 2.7. 2 uh, but my point is just that this does everything you would want, and it's literally one formula, and it just doesn't get any simpler than this. So that would not be a lot of work, and I already have code that, that does that anyway. So. so the other thing is getting the users involved. And you might think that you would just create two different markets and have an objective function for one, an objective function for another. And you would then just look at them and see which price is higher, because this is a representation of a future reality if you a certain thing like that. But you can actually go way crazier than that by combining them. And now you've got four mutually exclusive states. You get a lot of stuff for free. Um, you get things like decision insurance. So you can just set up something that pays you a ton of Bitcoin if something that you don't like happens. So if you're interested in, you want to see the block size increase, you could bet that it would not increase. And then after you're disappointed, at least you get a lot of money. So it's you're sort of like hedging yourself, something like that. You can do that for you get that for free as just a result of this, you know, summing these things. You also get depends on you can bet on the objective function itself vertically. Um, but the cool thing is that for every n dimensions you have here, you get n minus one their relationships, and that lets things get really fancy because I don't really want to go into it because it takes a lot of time. But you can basically invest a total of one bitcoin and get a total of one bitcoin back if things didn't go your way. So. If you really wanted the block size to increase, you could do this thing where if it didn't increase, you'd get a Bitcoin back. But if it did increase, you would get something equal. The entire portfolio that you invested, the one Bitcoin would be worth the Bitcoin return between now and the time that you made the investment. And you can go even crazier than that by multiplying again by the exchange rate. And you can put that entire process in cash. So believe it or not, um, you can actually start with $500 US and end up with at least $500 or more, even if the Bitcoin price collapses, as long as it doesn't go to zero. It's actually the log price, but, so that's why that doesn't make sense. But you can start with $500 cash, and you can get it all back if someone screws up the, um, the, uh, the decision according to you. And, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> if, uh, if the decision goes the way you thought it should, you'd get something that co-varies with the objective function. So you basically always have, and tons of people have an incentive to participate in this. Uh, market and you can even charge these people a little bit of money for this like insurance service and this money can pool up as liquidity it's something called liquidity sensitive market scoring rule and then there's like a big pot of money for ideally like researchers to kind of like start fighting over and then as they fight over it more the market becomes even more liquid and that's how it might work it might work better so uh, so I'm just gonna really quickly go over the the benefits, the Oracle is a slightly annoying cost. But the main benefit is that you can use the price as an objective function. And the price kind of catches everything, right? It's like everything you would want, or if you, Bitcoin is useful, or whether or not it's different from something else that we already have. And so the price is kind of like this big funnel that catches everything. But even if you wanted to have lots and lots of different objective functions, 
Another benefit is that you can just keep redoing this. It's very simple. You just need the Oracle to type in these things later. Paul? Uh, yes. I think we're heading over time. Oh, yeah. For so the 15 you know, minute presentation. Okay. That's fine. Yes. Thanks for cutting me off. So I, it was awesome. Everything. Loved it. Okay, thanks a lot. So All I just right. want people to remember to, uh, this, this point is really important about agreeing Paul? with the objective function. Yeah. It's time to go. All right, this is Thanks. All right. Thank you very much, Paul. That was awesome. And uh, the slides will be online. We now quickly welcome Taj Dreyer and Joseph Poon for our lightning talk. Welcome. Hello. Oh. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Taj Dreyer. This is Joseph Poon. We're co-authors of the Lightning Network paper. And ah, that's cool. And I'm going to talk a little bit about sort of bad things. Bitcoin failure modes, how this can go wrong. And uh, Joseph will talk a little bit about how the Lightning Network can help. Uh, cool. OK, so I'll start. Um, OK, so we'll start off by saying that Bitcoin is working, which is really cool. Uh, transactions are propagated. Blocks start with a lot of zeros. Coins seem to stay put when you don't move them and move when you tell them to. And this is really cool, and I didn't think that would happen. Um, but it does, so this is great. So we're starting from a good place. Um, but we should acknowledge that Bitcoin can fail, uh, but, but anti-fragile, right? So are you, you know, am I talking about the final block of Bitcoin? You know, what, what is the block height of the final block? There are maybe fates worse than a final block. Um, so I have a Bitcoin failure bathtub, and I put some you know, global data rate on the bottom, which is totally made up, but um, it fails on both sides. Um, it, it can fail if you go too far in any direction. And so there's this sort of Goldilocks zone or middle of the bathtub. Maybe I shouldn't mix metaphors. Or, but uh, there's, a, there's a good place in the middle. Um, and so the block size bathtub, uh, we can take the extreme numbers so that we all agree that, like, yeah, this is crazy. So what would Bitcoin be like with one kilobyte blocks? Uh, so maybe one byte per second. You could sort of talk the blockchain to people over the phone. Um, how about with one petabyte blocks? So it would be about a terabyte of data a second. Um, and I think everyone can agree that both sides are pretty bad. And we can sort of call both failure. Um, however, in this model, we sort of uh, underlying assumption in both of these failure modes is that every human on planet Earth wants to use Bitcoin and would if they could. And so actually, this is not a particularly pessimistic view of failure, um, because most people don't know about Bitcoin or care. Uh, so we're assuming everyone wants to use this. OK, so first I'll talk about the red side. Um, uh, this is a key failure. And one transaction per block means there's maybe 100 transactions a day. The block size increases by you know, 50 megs a year, which is good in that you can run a full node on your phone. Uh, 50 megs is no, no big deal. Um, however, there's maybe 10 large institutions in the world that actually have private keys and can make transactions. So you got Coinbase, ChangeDip, Bank of America, BNY Mellon. They have keys. You don't. Uh, but you have sort of bank accounts with them. Uh, this is a very possible thing, and it's a, it's a failure. Um, this is a failure because you don't have the keys. You don't have the coins. This was sort of the central promise of Bitcoin. You can't be your own bank. You can, however, verify all balances that your bank holds for you. So it's kind of like good delivery bars in the basement of a bank. And you can maybe see them, but you can't touch them. And it's a little bit better than good delivery bars because it's, it's more like this picture than that picture because you can sort of see it. You can verify it. But it's, it's still a failure mode. Um, so look at the blue side. Um, this is a 21 million failure. Uh, so in this case, you have you know, 50 exabytes a year block size increase. Um, all seven giga humans can use Bitcoin as many times a day as they want. Uh, they've got a gazillion private keys on their phone. SPV still works. Uh, the proofs are quite compact. Maybe it's you know, 20 steps instead of 10. Um, and phones can store the header set for, for SPV validations, 4 megs a year. Um, however, in this case, there's maybe 10 large institutions that can store and verify the blockchain. So you got Amazon, Visa, Google, Bank of America, UnionPay. Slightly different set of factors, maybe, but same idea. Uh, you can verify when you receive points. But you can't verify everyone else's. So there's really no way to be sure there's 21 million coins. There may have been more that sort of got in there without you knowing. And unless you've got a global view of it, you don't know the total capitalization. Um, 
So in that case, the failure mode is sort of like Federal Reserve notes. You don't really know how many dollars there are. You can val validate individual dollars and see that they're not counterfeit. But the total amount of dollars, I don't know. You can ask Fred. But um, So what we want to do is expand the bathtub. Um, we off we want to make sure that we're within the bathtub. And that's sort of why we have this conference. But also expanding it would help. And in this, it's you know, totally not to scale. I don't think you know, a 512 gigabyte per second rate actually would be within the bathtub. It's probably way too high. Um, so how can we expand usability without hurting verifiability? So methods that you know, move things user to user and have user verification without global verification. And so one way to help with this is linked nodes of payment channels. And it sort of expands the bathtub to the red side, where more people can use it without the higher global throughput. And Joseph will talk about how we can do that. Yeah, so an example of expanding this, expanding this bathtub is what we've been working on called the Lightning Network. And the idea is that, you know, even if you're not, you know, totally picking the right point, maybe it's a little bit low, um, or, you know, and you need to mitigate the problems where, you know, when things get high, the validation starts getting really complicated, um, you can still be able to use Bitcoin, you can have your own private keys and use, the, use real Bitcoin. Um, and the problems it really helps with is to net settle many transactions, especially micropayments. Um, so, for example, you can have one blockchain transactions and it can be um, the net sum of, you know, many hundreds or thousands or millions of transactions. Um, and there are things which it helps which you can't do on Bitcoin today. Um, a lot of people think you can do micropayments on Bitcoin. It's not really true. Um, micropayments which are below a minimum fee, um, like uh, one penny or even a tenth of a penny or a hundredth of a penny. Um, Bitcoin blockchain transactions are about, you know, three cents today, somewhere in that range. Um, you might be able to get down to two cents or a little bit below that, but you definitely will have trouble sending, you know, a hundredth of a cent. And something like uh, a network of payment channels certainly helps with that. Um, and if fees ever start going up or down or something based on, you know, variability in the times, um, a fee market where large value transaction crowds out low value transactions where, you know, the confirmation times start getting very high um, will be very complicated. And Lightning is, and other payment channel networks are very, are, do instant transactions. Um, it also helps with the UTXO set float. Um, and there's not much talk about this, but the problem is basically where if you are receiving, you know, a million micropayments um, on chain, um, it's sort of like no matter like how big the block size is within reason, um, you're going to have trouble because you're going to be having a million transactions as your inputs with a single output, right? That's a really, really big transaction. Um, these cases can happen in the future, for example, if you're getting paid, like a newspaper is getting paid for a very popular article or something like that, and you're might be signing, you know, a hundred, like a million times or whatever it is um, for only a couple cents. Um, you might have seen these types of transactions if you like browse around blockchain.info and you're like, whoa, <laughs> what's going on with this transaction? Um, yeah, those transactions are pretty crazy and you want to really minimize those because they're a large component of uh, blockchain bloat. And the idea of something like the Lightning Network is where um, you have a channel open. So for example, Alice has a channel open with Bob, Bob has a channel open with Carol, and Carol has a channel open with Dave. Alice can pay Dave without direct counterparty risk for each hop. So there's no component where like Bob and Carol can like steal the funds in transit um, where you know directly and easily they're just like, okay, here's the money, I'm just gonna take it. Um, and you can do that by encumbering it in cryptographic hashes. Um, using directly on, big on like Bitcoin scripts, which if um, there is non-cooperation, it does hit the chain. Um, but otherwise, it's all off-chain. Um, while these are actual Bitcoin transactions with consensus enforced on the blockchain, um, payment, pa payment paths are local. Um, so we do need to focus on designing this correctly and ensuring that it is decentralized and within the spirit of Bitcoin's values. Um, and the primary aspect is to ensure there's no custodial ownership along the path, especially payment. Um, and that means that you need open participation, anyone can run a node, and you need extremely low fees as a result. 
So trusting a third party custodian with your balance um, will be giving them a lot of economic rent. Um, so that means that if you're trusting someone for your money, um, you're sort of trusting them not to screw you over. So you know they might charge a higher amount for that. Um, routing is also very, very important um, because routing is sort of like everything. It's your client that sort of decides how to route. So that's sort of a local rule in a sense. And therefore, it's really important to ensure and enforce routing maintains decentralization. And it's really also important to make sure wallets are also channel nodes uh, to ensure this form of decentralization. And the ideal is you sort of create this system in which you, know, you can do small Bitcoin transactions uh, in very, very high volume on Bitcoin and it maintains like the promise of Bitcoin. And that way you can sort of like be within the bathtub. Yeah, do we have time? We, oh, well, we can also, no. yeah. um, the other thing, we can sort of look at within the failure modes, like where in the bathtub you want to be. Um, my personal feeling is that the red side is probably safer yeah. in that, you know, you want the extra functionality, but one of the assumptions here was that all 7 billion people want to use Bitcoin. That may not be the case and that may never be the case. Um, and it's, it's, it's a kind of a crazy assumption also because maybe no one wants to use it because it's too expensive to make transactions. And they're saying like, why should I sign up for this new system where uh, you know, some third party entity has all the private keys? That's not really advantageous. Um, however, there's a, in both cases, there's a lot of things you can do to mitigate these failures. So in the case of you know, two large uh, transactions, you know, there's SPV, fraud proofs, um, a lot of things like that. And then on the lower uh, bandwidth side, you can have you know, proof of solvency, you know, different proofs where you are minimizing the trust to these institutions. They're actually quite different though. So then in both sort of modes where we're not in a place where we wanna be, we have these institutions that are now sort of centralized and we can have ways to mitigate that centralization. Yeah, and our thinking for doing this presentation is that like, we can all agree that we really don't want to be on either side and we sort of define this like common ground. Yeah, so, right. so you know, where exactly that is, that's a very difficult problem because everyone's going to have a different opinion, but at least as long as everyone's like, yeah, let's be here, let's be here, let's be here, then we can sort of put boundaries and try to figure out how to, you know, work within there. And so then- Which side is ideal? I think like my opinion is, you know, towards the left, but you know, within reason. Um, but, but you want the functionality because then that 7 billion people wanting to use it will never happen yeah. <laughs> if, if you don't have the functionality there. Um, okay, so I think we're probably early, but <laughs> any questions or we're good? Or? We're good? Okay, thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Joseph, and thank you, Taj. Uh, just so everybody knows, we are now into payment channels uh, and the section of the layer two of the presentation, so that was the first actual presentation in pay and, and channels and layer two if anybody's confused. And uh, thanks again. So next up, uh, we're going to have uh, CJ Ploy on experiencing experiences working on layer two scalability. Welcome, Corney. Please give him a hand. So, thank you. Um, I could talk for hours about uh, the, my project Amico Pay and why I think it is so important for the future of uh, scalable Bitcoin. But uh, thankfully, thanks to the pres uh, previous presentation, uh, that saves me a lot of work because in essence, uh, Amico Pay aims to be, become an implementation of the Lightning Network. So uh, the previous presentation should, give you a, should have given you a good uh, view of the importance of this. Now, there is a little bit more to Amico Pay because if you look to the, the basic design of the Lightning Network, such a, a, a network of uh, payment channels, this is actually quite an old idea. There have been several variations of this and the Lightning Network just happens to be the, the best so far. But uh, you can imagine other designs. Um, so what Amico Pay aims to do is it focuses on the, uh, the nodes on the, the, that do the routing of the uh, of uh, transactions, and um, so 
the focus is more on the routing and the other big problem of Amico Pay, th ma making the transaction channel, that is uh, sort of delegated to uh, plugins in Amico Pay. So for different types of uh, channels, you can make different plugins. And this kind of design uh, makes it possible to, uh, to have different kinds of uh, channels in, uh, within the same network. And that opens up a couple of uh, possibilities. One, uh, one thing is um, these channels can be different uh, uh, in technology, so they can uh, offer a different, different trade-off in security versus convenience. Um, another difference is they could actually be running on uh, different blockchains. So um, that would make this network useful, for instance, for, for instant transfer of funds between side chains. Um, and well, when you talk about side chains, it is still uh, the same assets that you are trading. But imagine uh, if different chains uh, you, uh, trade different assets or di different channels you uh, trade different assets, then the, um, the nodes uh, have become a sort of an exchange function. Now that this would make uh, the nodes a, a lot more complicated. Um, so f for now, I'm not going to implement that in Amico Pay, uh, but it's interesting to think of that possibility in the future because it could give you decentralized uh, exchanges. Um, so uh, in terms of channel types, uh, what, uh, what has been implemented for now is a Ripple style IOU channel that is not a real uh, microtransaction channel. It is just uh, uh, an object that uh, fills in the place of uh, a microtransaction channel and only does some bookkeeping of who owes what. And of course, this, this gives no protection, uh, no security whatsoever. But for, for software testing, it is really useful because it is trivial to implement this one. Um, but I even think that in the future, um, this will continue to be useful, for instance, but in for links between nodes that can fully trust each other. And that could be, for instance, uh, uh, when several different nodes are run by the same organization, they, they can fully trust each other. Um, now, of course, the obvious thing that we need in the future is a true lightning uh, channel. And uh, there are two approaches towards developing that. The, the, the Lightning developers themselves are uh, developing uh, it on a side chain. That is because the, uh, the, the Lightning channel design requires certain features in Bitcoin that are not, not yet present. Um, uh, so uh, the Lightning developers work on a side chain that has those uh, new features. For Amico Pay, I chose a different approach. I, I uh, don't want to depend on the Bitcoin developers to give me those, uh, uh, those new features. So what I did, I, I, I designed a, a different channel type that emulates these, uh, these missing features with an escrow service. So now you sort of have to depend on the escrow service to correctly uh, um, evaluate all the, the things that are not evaluated by a Bitcoin script. script. So that is not nearly as secure, but uh, I wrote a paper out about this. You can find it on the website. Um, um, and um, I think uh, it is actually good enough for real world usage. So these are a couple of different channel designs that could be useful. Um, so finally, some, some issues and thoughts that uh, I would like to share with you about this, uh, uh, this type of software. And the, the, the design of this software turns out to be really complex uh, 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 in terms of everything is connected to everything else. You, you have a channel and typically there are multiple transactions going on at once in the channel and they all uh, are related to the state of the channel. And uh, uh, the state of a transaction, the transaction is also connected to another channel. Uh, so it also affects the state of that other channel and it is hard to uh, keep everything uh, consistent. I think I've tackled that more or less now after a couple of uh, attempts. Uh, the only remaining thing is that because of this complexity, there are a lot of, lot of open issues uh, in, uh, in the security of the software. So it's a, it's a long to-do list of solving, uh, um, solving uh, security issues. And as, long, as soon as that, uh, the length of that list drops to zero, I think it is ready for a release of the software. Now, 
Next thing, uh, transaction malleability continues to be a problem. Even for that uh, channel type that I designed, uh, there is still a transaction malleability problem. So my, my message to the, the core developers of, of Bitcoin is please solve uh, the transaction malleability issue. That's really important. Another really important thing in, in the design of uh, um, Amico Pay and the Lightning Network was already stressed in the pre previous presentation is the design of the routing. Um, routing, uh, the details in the routing the, uh, really matter for, for ensuring privacy of the users. And that's not just for the protection of these individual users, but also for the protection of the network as a whole. Because if you don't have privacy, in this kind of network, you risk the, uh, uh, losing the, the open access uh, uh, property of the network. Um, so it's really important to focus the attention on this one. And the final thought is um, um, there are some, some economical uh, things that need attention in, uh, in the Lightning Network. Uh, in order to create a payment channel, you need to lock up some funds in the, in the channel and uh, people need to be motivated to lock up their funds for a longer amount of time. So um, you need a sort of a return on investment in, in uh, f probably from transaction fees. And uh, um, well, there, are some, there is some discussion going on on the Lightning development mailing list on how to, uh, uh, what would be right and what would be, would be wrong on this. Personally, I am a bit skeptical about armchair economics and uh, I think it just, try it in practice and see what works and what doesn't work, uh, what, what people will do. So um, what I hope is that Amico Pay will, uh, 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 will make this possible and uh, let's see how, it's, uh, how it goes. Thank you. Thank you. All right, that was awesome. Just heard about Amico Pay and the final presentation in our Lightning Payment Channels and Layer 2 discussions. Uh, STROM, a protocol for microtransactions uh, by Joel Franson. Uh, and after that, we're going to have a coffee break because you guys look like you need a coffee break, right? Yes? All right. Does anybody disagree with anything I ever say here? I, I can't hear you. All right. <laughs> All right, Jarl, for uh, Strom, a protocol for microtransactions. Before the break, let's give it up a round of applause. Thank you. <clears throat> Hello, and uh, thanks for this great conference. I think we're really onto something new here. Um, so, um, seven transactions per second, or is it three? Um, that's what we here we can do with Bitcoin. So what if you need 100,000 transactions per second? So, okay. So, so I'm going to talk about uh, our approach to scaling the use of Bitcoin for microtransactions. My name is Joel Franson and I come from StrawPay. And uh, we've been looking into Bitcoin for a long time. And uh, when we learned about scripting and the power of contracts, like payment channels, we thought uh, maybe it's time to do microtransactions right. And to give a little perspective on scale, let's say a billion people makes 25 small transactions a day. Uh, that's maybe a, a fifth of your average page views people do today on the internet. So these are really small amounts, so a, a user would only spend a few dollars a day on this. So my point is, this is actually a lot of transactions. On average, it's about 300,000 transactions per second. So we, we uh, had uh, three design requirements when we uh, started on this. So the first one, and maybe most important, is to focus on the user. And uh, may maybe the Bitcoin community hasn't always done that, so we kind of started there. And users really need a simple click to buy, and they don't want to wait or log in or register before purchasing. And 
it's important the system works for mobile devices, which, which are not always online. Second requirement is efficiency. And of course, a scalable system needs a high level of efficiency to work. And also, if you sell things for a few cents, you need a really low transaction cost. The third requirement is it actually has to work in a larger economy. And uh, inside the community, we maybe forget that sometimes. But merchants today, they really want to get paid in local currencies. Consumers are fine with using Bitcoin when we ask them, but they don't really want to hold it. So users need a way to easily trade in and out of Bitcoin. And this has been said many times. And maybe they don't even have to know they're using Bitcoin. So um, it seems uh, plain Bitcoin won't work here. <clears throat> and what about using payment channels to connect consumers to a special payment provider? <clears throat> so instead of a special payment provider for microtransactions, we introduce issuers and they do a similar thing as a payment provider but they do it over an open protocol uh, to create a liquid market for payments. So maybe we have a little different approach to this in just connecting payment channels together. So we call the protocol Strom, and it's really a middleware layer on top of Bitcoin. And I'd like to do a walkthrough of a transaction, how it works. So in this example, Lisa wants to buy an article from Aftonbladet, which is a Swedish news site. Uh, she clicks on an article and she's presented with an offer. The wallet presents her with an offer. When she accepts, uh, the wallet connects to her selected issuer uh, using a payment channel and it buys a digital promissory note. So this is a, a time-limited promise by the issuer uh, to pay the amount of the purchase uh, to the owner of the note. Next, the wallet adds some information about the purchase, transfers it to the merchant, merchant validates the payment and delivers the article. And the idea is that this whole process takes less than a second. Um, and it's interesting to note in, this, in this, this time the consumer is out of the transaction. So the consumer has no liability to anyone. And this is sort of, we focus on the consumer experience. We wanted to this, this to get you know, over and very easily, to support a really good user experience. Later, maybe at the end of the day, uh, all, the, all the payments, the aggregated uh, promissory notes are redeemed at the issuer. Uh, the issuer pays the merchant uh, the total sum minus some fee. So the point here was to make this, make this an open protocol so anyone can participate. So as another example, some, someone like Wells Fargo could issue notes denominated in Bitcoin to facilitate these microtransactions for their customers. Uh, now merchants have to uh, accept and redeem uh, these notes from different issuers. So we see there is need for a redeemer role that will buy all the notes from merchants and then redeem them with different issuers. So for, for the long term, we, we envision kind of a network where a lot of actors compete in an open market. So Strom is a middleware then for microtransactions. The focus is really on the consumer merchant, the interaction between the consumer and the merchant. And it uses digital forms of the concepts offer, order, payment, and receipt. Uh, and how the payment actually is done is flexible. So today we, we, we pay uh, merchants in Bitcoin, standard Bitcoin transactions, but we could use payment channels if they would redeem frequently. Uh, but then they wouldn't aggregate payments, but then we could redeem them at, as soon as they happen. Or in the future, we, we could use a lightning network or something similar uh, when, when it gets operational. Um, but a lot of merchants will probably want to get paid in fiat currency. Um, that's what we think, but we don't know. So how can we construct a digital note for this kind of application? So it's a set of attributes. Typically it contains important things like the amount, the issuer, and the validity time. When it's uh, created, it's signed by the issuer to the first owner, which in this case is the consumer, uh, using a digital signature. 
the consumer makes a payment by transferring it to the merchant and that's done with a second signature then. So to transfer these notes, you need to create a digital signature, which means you need to uh, control the private key of the owner. So basically, these uh, notes shouldn't be easy to steal. It's a sort of similar thing to Bitcoin. You need to keep track of your private keys. Uh, the merchant redeems the payment in a similar way. That's a third signature. Um, and uh, at each transfer, it's possible to add and, and uh, authorize some information about the transfer. And we use that to create an atomic transaction of the payment and the order. So because this is a signed thing, we, we say it's an authorized order. And because it's a single signature for both the payment and the order, uh, the payer cannot actually dispute the order. We might actually don't know who is the payer, but we know that the whoever paid cannot dispute the order. We support aggregation by having a special block transfer mechanism where you can take a potentially very large set of payments and transfer them with a sin single signature. These blocks can then be split and, and uh, transferred to different issuers if we need. Uh, another thing is uh, for double spend verification, we use a quite simple mechanism. So when an issuer finally redeems a note, um, the history of the transfers must match or actually include a list of verifiers that, that's decided at the time of issue. Um, this, this actually gives a protocol some, some nice offline properties. So to transact, the issuers, they have to be online all the time to provide their service. Consumers, they only have to be online when they make payments, and uh, that's good because it works on mobile phones and, and mobile devices. But merchants, they can actually be offline and uh, still receive payments and do validation. And uh, that's important for the transaction aggregation we want to happen at, at the merchant or at the redeemers. But it also lets us uh, more easily support things like point of sale applications or vending machines that, that actually don't have to be online, as long as they're online every, every 10 minutes or every hour or something like that. Um, so these notes are also time limited, and this is mostly to limit the double spend verification resources needed, and it's similar to electronic cash. But uh, it also means that these notes cannot work as money, because they will time out and become worthless. Uh, and I'm, I'm, uh, I'm making this a quick overview. So, uh, in Strom, payments are actually sold when they're routed. And this implies that some important properties of, of the whole system is not decided by us, but decided by markets. So things like the fee, uh, the, the level of aggregation, uh, the validity time, and also which redeemers or issuers to use, is actually decided by markets. So to, to put it all together, um, the question is, does this scale? Um, and I will skip the details of this, this table of the sig signature operations for the system, but we can see that the issuer spends three signature operations per transaction, and a lot of these are in, are in batches. So we, we actually think that this system can actually scale with current hardware and the best signature algorithms to, to very high levels if, if that's needed. So. This was a quick overview. Um, if you want to find out more, read our paper about microtransactions and Strom. Uh, you find it on our webpage. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Jarl. It's awesome. OK, everyone, thank you so much. You have survived and won a coffee break for 20 minutes, where you can talk to Jarl. You can talk to uh, Conray about Mikope, as well as our guys Joseph and Taj. And Paul is going to be also here, so we can chat with him as well. And of course, Masuto san. Thank you all. See you in 20 minutes. Let's get some coffee. Woo! And to remember, by the time you come back for coffee, we should have solved transaction malleability, okay? Let's put this one in the bag. <laughs>
yeah, sit next to me, sit next to me. So, so, wait, you're Satoshi. Yeah, man. I mean, after I sent that email, I thought that everyone hey, would. Wait, hold on. I knew Satoshi was here, but I didn't know he would come up to me. So, what do you think so far about staying in Bitcoin? Uh, I think it's good. Yeah. Wasn't too happy with some of the talks. Right, right, right. I mean, you, you kind of disappeared for a while, though. Yeah, I'm keeping a low profile. Yeah, yeah, you don't want people to. I mean, I wouldn't. Jesus, wow. Can I touch you? Okay. <laughs> Sorry, I just. <laughs> Satoshi. <laughs> Yeah, so, um, yeah, so, um, Satoshi, listen, it, I don't know, I mean, I like, what do you, I mean, what do you want to, are you going to talk to people and stuff? What are you going to do? No. Nah. No? You're just going to watch? Yeah. Just going to watch. Okay. All right. The, the key strategy people don't realize is, uh, yeah. you sit in the back, that's where people, that's people, where people are hiding. You sit in the front, no one notices. You know, that's why I noticed when you were, like, sitting there looking intently, I thought, you know, Sato you know, only Satoshi would look the way you're looking right now. So, you know, um, that payment network stuff is really hot, right? Like, you like that stuff, don't you? I think it's pretty cool, yeah, but definitely yeah. not, it's not core. It's not core. As yeah, long core as you forever, it on top. Yeah, core forever, core forever. Um, all right, so are you, are you, I mean, I'm not, can I get an autograph? Uh, I'm probably going to duck out for a little bit now. All right, all right, all right, great. I'll see you, dude. All right.
Welcome back, everyone. We're back. Sunday morning, Sunday morning, Sunday morning, Bitcoin. Sunday morning, Sunday morning, Sunday morning, blockchain. I like my SHA-3. I like my 256. It's Sunday morning in Bitcoin. Woo! It's Sunday morning. I have my private keys. They're in cold storage. You know what I mean. It's Sunday morning, isn't it, Alex? It's Sunday morning. It's Sunday morning. And we are looking at mining. It's Sunday morning. Payment channels are done. It's five o'clock somewhere. <laughs> I think Satoshi Nakamoto is here today. It's, uh, wait, where's Peter Todd? Peter Todd, raise your hand. Oh my goodness, they took Peter Todd out. <laughs> With the money? <laughs> oh my goodness, I bought Bitcoins. <laughs> I have Bitcoins. I don't have Ethers or any other altcoin. <laughs> it's Sunday morning. It's time to start again with our next presentation on mining. So this begins our mining segment. Thanks, everyone. Everyone's smiling. I think the coffee's working and the endorphins are flowing. Yes, can I get a round of applause for coffee? <laughs> Woo! All right. Just remember, hashtag today is scaling Bitcoin. Please make sure to use it on Twitter, Facebook, and on Reddit. It's the live stream on Bitcoin, our Bitcoin, Reddit. Reddit, 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 our Bitcoin. And of course, on the IRC. To all my friends in IRC, here's looking at you guys. All right. Now, uh, I will, without ado, introduce our next presenter, Mr. Sven Valfels, as he talks about how to mine Bitcoin profitably. Take it, Sven. Come on. Whoa, 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 whoa. Let's welcome him, please. Yeah. Woo. Thank you very much for the warm introduction. I'm um, Sven Valfels. Um, I got to know about Bitcoin in mid-2011. Uh, my co-author is Jon Eilson. Uh, I told him about Bitcoin shortly afterwards. We had just finished campaigning against uh, uh, a government le legislation in Iceland which would have imposed 40% of GDP for private bank liabilities on the sovereign uh, balance sheet. Uh, we managed to stop that uh, from happening <laughs> together with some other good people. And we thought Bitcoin, immediately recognized Bitcoin as being a really, really good idea for an unstable and an inefficient financial world. And we've been, uh, well, affected by it ever since. So I'm going to dive into the topic of this uh, presentation, which is how to mine Bitcoin profitably. Now, mining is, there you go. Um, this is a short talk, or supposed to be a short talk. So um, let's get straight to the, uh, the crux of the matter. It, mining is the lowest level of the Bitcoin transaction stack. From a technological point of view, it's, it scales easily because it's parallelizable. So uh, of course there are some, possibly some second order effects to that, but in principle it's scalable. Uh, that computation that's conducted on the uh, blockchain every um, 10 minutes or so. So, um, but what's, Technology is cool, technology is clever, technology is fun, but money ultimately makes the world go round and uh, economics imposes a constraint on us all. So we decided, Jon and I, to uh, ask the question, if we were a miner, how much capacity could we profitably ask and uh, profitably add to the network and at what cost? And this question really defines the economic scalability of Bitcoin mining, not the technological scalability. So moving on to the next slide. Um, um, so we decided to construct what we call a Bitcoin mining profit function, which would capture most of the first order, all of the first order effects of Bitcoin mining revenues and Bitcoin mining costs. So I, let me walk you briefly through this uh, uh, equation over there, this function. It's the function, profit function. Economists like to call, uh, pro use pi for to denote profits. 
So it's pi of x, x being additional capacity that I'm adding to the network, uh, equals revenues uh, minus uh, operating costs uh, minus uh, capital costs. So it's as simple as that. And as, as we all for well know, if we add capacity x, uh, it will capture a, a proportion of the Bitcoin network, thereby a proportion of the Bitcoin revenues. Um, the supply is uh, predetermined. We all know how that, how that behaves. But the Bitcoin price is volatile, and so are the transaction fees. Now, if we subtract the operating costs, then um, I, in the first so the simplistic version of this equation, I just use a factor of capital C to denote the uh, OPEX uh, costs, and they scale with the amount of capacity that you have. And for the fixed costs, um, they're amortized over a period T, uh, and they scale. Uh, there's variable investment costs and also um, uh, fixed uh, uh, costs of, uh, of non-recurring non -recurring engineering costs, as it were, of installing capacity. Now, you can apply this to either to the system or the deployment environment. And what you get, you get an um, if you plot this equation, it looks like the, profit, the revenues look like this, um, the investment costs approximately look like this, and the operating costs look like this, and you add the two and you get the total cost, and in between lies your profit. So if you have an intersection between these two curves, you will actually be able to mine profitably, um, and you will achieve break even once you exceed your fixed costs of investment and get into profitable ter territory. There will be a point of maximum profitability. There's an upper break even point once your uh, revenues start flattening off and you, you intersect the total cost curve again. And ultimately, there's a maximum capacity that you can put and still mine profitably. That's where the revenues start, uh, where the operational cost starts exceeding the revenues. So if we take this um, little beast of a, an equation and play around with it, we can actually analytically solve for all these points. So, um, yes. Okay. So let's just look at H cap at the top left. We can see that it's really inversely proportional to the operating expenses. Um, uh, the hash, hash rate of maximum profitability, however, is inversely proportional to the square root of the operating expenses plus uh, a factor which is uh, correlated with the uh, variable investment co costs. And then you, you get some uh, pretty large expression for the upper and lower break-even costs. And from the break-even costs, wh what you can do if you uh, if you set this equation here, if you set this determinant, as it's called, of, uh, of this uh, under the square root here equal to zero, and you find the roots of those equations, then you can find what is your shortest payback period uh, for you to recover your mining investment. Now, we ran this on some data, and we essentially estimated the characteristics of what we consider to be three generations of ASICs that have been deployed on the network, generation one, generation two, generation three. We break down the, um, the constant which uh, uh, determines the OPEX into four factors, co-location costs, which are primarily energy costs. The uh, POW is the power consumption of the uh, ASICs or the system the power usage efficiency of the data center, and a utilization factor, which uh, tells you the, which basically measures the uptime characteristic of your system. And um, I just throw your attention to generation three here, which is probably, there are people in the audience who have actually implemented these on the network, but there you have uh, ASICs, which consume approximately 0.1 uh, watt per giga hash, these are FinFET ASICs. They would cost probably about eight million to tape out. And if you have a really nice setup in a, in a data center, you would probably pay about $50 per kilowatt, kilowatt per month to run them. Now, given these numbers, which are estimates, um, but educated guesses as to what the market is doing, you can see that the first, two genera the first generation is, um, is no longer profitable. This is the, the growth in the hash rate of the network, 
and it had, has exceeded the, the maximum uh, hash rate of generation one, it's close to exceeding the maximum hash rate of generation two, but it, um, it still has some way to go to put to generation three out of business. And these are the implied um, uh, payback times. So the, for generation one, the payback time is off the charts. Generation two is heading off the charts, probably around 10 years right now. And generation three is just at one year. So the conclusion here is that Generation three is still profitable. But how much capacity could we add? Now, let's, for purposes of adding capacity to the system, let's take uh, our amortization time as three years. Um, that's not unreasonable because maximum process of power efficiency doubles every three years. So you could easily uh, argue that you should uh, write off your equipment in about three years' time. Uh, then we can plot uh, an actual function like this. Now, these are the profits. Um, those are the revenues, those are the total costs, and the capex and the op opex. And we see for t equals 3, the, and at, uh, a network that's running at 368 petahash, we can, the lower break-even point for our system is 373 um, petahash. We, can, uh, we hit break-even once we add 5 petahash of capacity. Uh, the upper break even point is about 1,300 petahash. Our sweet spot is about 700 petahash. We would be mining at 93% margin currently if we had this system deployed. But the, the price of getting five petahash onto the network is approximately $10 million under these assumptions. So the, the cost of entry is getting steep. Now, this is how the game is get, will be played over the foreseeable future, I believe, that people will race to find cheap sources of energy, possibly free sources of energy. They will design very efficient ASICs and try to deploy them in very efficient ways. But uh, I, don't, I think mining is far from equilibrium. Um, pursuing the existing technology and deployment scenarios, we could get up to uh, about 1,300 petahash easily. Uh, but if somebody clever figures out a way, and I think, well, there's at least one company in space that has announced plans for doing so, of distributing processors uh, in various places uh, and making them on scale so they would be very cheap and dis distributing them or embedding them into systems where, um, where whoever operates the system could decide to turn the processor on or off at their discretion. We could allow for even more efficient mining than today. So I think embedded mining um, has potential to disrupt this, the mining sector as it now is, um, is Sven? operated. Yes. Sven? Yes. I think we're nearly out of time. How are you doing? Uh, wrap up slide. So, so mining has room for profitable growth. That's the conclusion of the talk. And Bitcoin. I believe is a compelling innovation that is likely to scale. Uh, I'd like to thank Satoshi for sharing his idea with us. And I'd like to thank everybody who contributed to the idea. And I think it really is up to us to see if we can scale with Bitcoin, because I think it will eventually. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Excellent presentation. And we are rocking and rolling along uh, to our next presenter. Uh, Marshall Long. Marshall says he has the hotness to share with us on Bitcoin mining. Also, please make sure to collect your bingo cards before the morning's out. They're being passed on on the left side. All right. Since we're... Marshall, are you getting ready? Are you excited? Are you pumped? Definitely. Is this stuff going to be <laughs> dense, totally technical and intense? <laughs> <laughs> so we have a bingo winner. Please give a hand for our bingo winner. <laughs> What's your name, sir? You said a prize. Excellent. All right, with that, we will welcome Marshall to talk about Bitcoin mining. Give Marshall a hand, please. So first off, let me apologize for my voice. Just got back from Shanghai. I got a little sick from the pollution. So... Um, so I'm Marshall. I run a company called Finohash, CTO of Cripsy also. 
but uh, really glad Sven went first. Uh, a lot of his estimates were actually really, really close to being accurate. The numbers I'll be showing here are from, uh, I would say, a nice average medium from all the professional miners. Uh, some of the people have higher costs, some people have lower. I think these are pretty good estimates here from true costs. So we're talking a, a little bit more about why fees are very soon going to be very important. Uh, so let's just jump into it. So we'll talk a little bit about what happens without fees, talk about uh, why Bitcoin really isn't free, but how we can do cool things like uh, microtransactions later, uh, real microtransactions. We'll talk about the cost and uh, talk about some other solutions. So without fees, everybody knows there's a lack of security. Uh, however, miners aren't, even today, and I'll go on to show why fees are really negligible for us. Um, even at 10x what the current fees are, still we don't care. It's not paying our bills. Uh, we'll kind of dig into some more numbers here in a little bit. Fees at this point in time, even if they're at 10x, getting close to even at 100x, um, they're not cutting it. And as these block halvings continue to go down and down and down, we get into a really scary place where, let's say at the next block halving, half the hash rate pulls off and now we're Instead of a two week difficulty adjustment, we're looking at a six week difficulty adjustment. Uh, it kind of gets really bad at that point because fees just aren't an incentive. Everybody says fees are, they're not. When you've got a $100,000 electric bill a month, you know, 20 bucks is nothing. So um, we need to figure out something because as the halvings continue to go down and down, if fees don't go up and up, we can get to a kind of a scary situation. So this. Uh, was from uh, a white paper that Danielle Pena did that was off of Peter R's paper. So I apologize if Peter, this was your original equation, but uh, I took it from her paper. So basically this equation kind of outlines the revenue model where it takes into account propagation time, orphan rates, um, which was talked a little bit about yesterday. And this I found to be almost exactly spot on with my mining costs. Also, a lot of my colleagues' mining costs that I reached out to. So, um, yeah, again, Peter, sorry, walking in. If this is your <laughs> equation, apologies. Um, so, what you'll see in this equation is that, as everybody knows, as block time or block size goes up, propagation time can get kind of wanky, and then you get into this uh, orphan rate. So, it takes into account orphan rate. Um, and so, we'll just kind of dig into some of the costs that we actually see. And then you guys will start to see why this is going to be getting pretty important. So this is some charts that are based off of the current generation gear. Uh, this will be changing in the next couple of months. There's about four chips coming out, which will effectively double these numbers. But uh, as you can see, uh, the top axis, that is uh, size of capacity in megawatts. On the left side, that is monthly revenue. So, and these are true numbers. Uh, and then there's three based on the price of power that you're paying. Um, in this, there's factored in labor costs, there's factored in uh, hardware amateur amortization costs, um, build out costs, a few other things like that. So as you can see here, even at three cents, you're not really gonna be profitable right off the bat because yes, gear is getting cheaper, but it's uh, electricity costs, it's expensive, labor, all this stuff. So even if you're at five megawatts right now, um, you're almost just at break even. <clears throat> now going forward, this gets a little bit better with the next generation of gear. Um, as Finn was saying, uh, the actual chips that are coming out, they're going to be around 0.2 watts per gigahash, most of them. Uh, some of the stuff uh, Sam is doing, his stuff's a little bit better. But this is kind of like a nice average, so it gets a little bit better, but we're coming to a technology cliff very quickly. Uh, going down in node size, it helps, but there's not much more room to go down. So getting really close to some Moore's Law issues. But um, this, is, this is kind of the scary part because these miners are coming out now. It will most of them be released in October. And even at these costs here, these are based off of real numbers. Uh, my data sets will be online. You guys can pull them down, tweak them if you'd like. Um, you start to see this kind of graph where it, it really depends on your power cost. Even if your power cost is almost free. At three cents, that's it's pretty much almost free. So now what 
my company has had to do is make strategic partnerships with governments and uh, co-location providers that will give us effectively free power in exchange for revenue share. Because if you don't, you can't pay your bills. Um, and this becomes why I feel there's a, there is a need for a fee market because if we don't figure it out in the next, well, before next summer, these numbers just get even worse because these numbers are all based off 25 Bitcoins per block. So um, there's gonna be a discussion on a round table I'll be doing uh, after lunch. We're gonna get into that. It's gonna be about uh, China relations, these kind of things. Um, but these, these graphs are from real hard numbers and they can only be fixed, I think, with a multitude of solutions. So like Lightning Network, that would be profitable for us. Uh, increased fees, but everybody needs to understand that Bitcoin is not free right now. But there are some cool things that we can do going on. So block size, okay, everybody wants to talk about it, whatever. It's got diminishing returns. Uh, because at the very first part, you'll get a lot of fees and as the block size gets bigger, that's not really a long-term solution. Now, one thing that we think is kind of exciting, a lot of my friends would really disagree with in the community for core dev, is this uh, thing where pools can share a mempool, basically where you can push transactions and then pay a monthly fee for free transactions. Now that's nice for us because we have a predictable revenue model going forward. Uh, it does have some centralization problems, but we're always open to solutions there. Where now you can do zero transaction fees on the blockchain, pay a monthly fee at the end of it. Um, there are some contractual issues there. I think Peter Todd's losing his mind right now. But uh, going forward, uh, we can also have some special fee structures. So there are solutions to be had. We're open to most of them. Um, that's pretty much where we've got. So hopefully this one and the Hong Kong one, there'll be more miners at the Hong Kong one. We can try to figure something out because next summer it's gonna get really real, really quickly. So that's what I've got to say. If you've got any questions, you guys can hit me in the hall sometime. Thanks. Thank you, Marshall. Okay. We continue along mining and network costs with uh, the next one. Initial block synchronization is quadratic time complexity. Wow. All right. This is going to be huge. Okay. Patrick, you ready? Okay. We're going to take off. Hold on. Yes, everybody, can we give Patrick a warm welcome? All right, go ahead, Patrick. Okay, so initial block synchronization, first of all, what is it? It's the process by which nodes join the Bitcoin network. This is what everybody does when you start the client, you download and you validate the entire blockchain. This is how we prevent double spends, it's how the security of the network is actually implemented. Now, who's responsible for doing this? Everybody. If you are not doing a full initial block synchronization, you're basically not on the Bitcoin network. So, as a simple hypothesis, which is that the block size growth is related to initial block synchronization as a simple function of the integral. As you can see on the right, there's a number of runtime complexities that are described here. Right now, the actual network looks like this. It's roughly linear growth. As you can see on the previous slide, that means that initial block synchronization is roughly quadratic time complexity right now, which looks like this. That's what we have today. That's not great. This is on my very fast desktop machine, synchronizing from a peer that's on the LAN. This is on a Raspberry Pi 2. That's about four or five days worth of synchronizing, and it didn't finish. It took another four or five days to finish for about eight days total. These are rough simulation numbers. If you assume that the blockchain continues to grow linearly, but the total cost is dropping 20% annually, as you can see, that's probably fine, probably if you assume we actually end up with a 20% annual capacity improvement. This is 20% growth of the block size and 20% improvement in capacity. Again, probably fine. But if we overshoot it, 
it's not okay. 20% annual increase in the block size, but a 10% increase in capacity results in a huge blow up in the total cost to synchronize, roughly 16x within about 10, 20 years, at which point nobody can join the network. Oops, there are now only the nodes that were running that entire time. Okay. All right, thank you, Patrick. Quadratic complexity in five minutes, people. That is Bitcoin. <laughs> All right, uh, so Eric is next, and we have an Eric's coming up to the table, uh, to the podium. And uh, I think Eric will be our last presenter. Nope, we have one more, sharding the blockchain thereafter for Vlad. We have a break after that. I love Eric's, uh, I follow Eric on the uh, Bitcoin development mailing list, so it's gonna be an awesome presentation, I know. Please give it up for Eric Lombroso, guys. All right. Can everyone hear me? Excellent. All right, so um, how many of you have uh, actually read the Satoshi white paper? Okay, that's good. Uh, um, it's a brilliant, uh, it's a brilliant uh, paper, but uh, as we've discovered in the last several years, uh, it's got a few serious limitations uh, that uh, we think can be fixed, but uh, they present some serious challenges, uh, especially for scaling. Um, amongst these, um, it was really built as a single code base, uh, which was meant to be run in its entirety on all machines, and all machines were going to participate equally in this peer-to-peer -peer network. So. In a homogenous network, every single node uh, pretty much runs the same software. Um, it pretty much offers the same services. And uh, this isn't really how the internet works. Uh, we have other kinds of uh, devices that uh, don't necessarily have the same capabilities as others. And in general, we have a, a very heterogeneous network. And different devices have very different capabilities. So for instance, uh, a handheld device that has intermittent internet access is probably not the best place to do mining. Uh, similarly, a very large server in some data center is probably not the best place to do point of sale authorization. So this was really something that was thought about, you know, like there, there's like almost like, you know, like a footnote in the, I mean, there's, there's, a, there's a section in the white paper covering these kinds of use cases, but it wasn't really the use cases that were really, uh, you know, fully thought out in the white paper originally. So then, of course, this is uh, an infamous one, uh, pooled mining was not really accounted for. Uh, once you get mining pools into the picture, uh, a very, very large number of nodes now no longer participate equally in the selection of which transactions go into blocks, uh, creating, you know, points of centralization and making it possible for people to maybe start censoring stuff or, you know, form uh, cartels or whatever, and um, then uh, you know also it, it, it amplifies errors. If any of these miners, if, if any of these mining pool operators uh, is running faulty software or has some other issue, um, that really quickly gets amplified. Whereas with the other, you know, homogenous network, really, um, you know, if someone decides to run some software that's like you know unconventional, uh, they're probably not going to screw up the rest of the network. Then on top of that, we have pressure of centralization where. Uh, minings, mining pools and, and miners uh, have an, an interest in reducing latency as much as possible, which uh, creates pressure to, to try to put all this equipment in one location or, you know, try, try to make it so that uh, they have, you know, special connections to each other that, that are no longer the peer-to-peer -peer links that, that are in the homogenous network. And, of course, um, one CPU, one vote. Um, we all know that... Uh, I mean, in the original uh, white paper, uh, the idea was that um, people would want to use their CPUs for, for honest reasons rather than trying to subvert the network because it was more profitable. But as we found out, uh, it, it turns out that you know, specialized hardware is much, much, much better at actually, um, actually uh, mining. So most of the CPUs now are not being used for that. And uh, there's you know, incentives still for uh, using you know, CPU power for other kinds of attacks on the network. 
And then, of course, there's a simplified payment verification, which was uh, kind of like a last minute idea as it, you know, it, it appears on the paper to be kind of like a last minute idea. How are we going to deal with this uh, situation where most devices are not mining anymore? Uh, so the idea was, you know, to have kind of like a client server architecture in a sense where the servers are all part of, you know, miners uh, and, uh, and clients basically, you know, get short proofs that their transactions are valid um, in a way that, that is cheap to verify on, on relatively small devices. Um, there's a few problems with this. Um, one of the things that, uh, that is commented is, you know, like there's certain things that we just cannot verify using SPV. For instance, we cannot fully verify that blocks are actually valid. We cannot verify any transactions that we did not ask for. Um, and we cannot verify other things that, that, that would be really relevant to, to, to um, wallets. For instance, whether a transaction has been spent or an output has been spent or not. Uh, we can prove it's been spent by demonstrating the, you know, if there's a spend proof, but there's no unspent proof. Um, so we need better crypt cryptographic commitment structures to be able to accomplish these kinds of things. Where, you know, we really want to be able to prove these things, construct very short, efficient proofs, um, and make it possible to to have small devices actually participate in the network and not have to trust anyone. So um, Bitcoin has a global state, you can call it that, where you basically it's the longest chain, everyone agrees on what the history is. Um, and then, you know, specific systems might have a, a, a smaller view into that of what they're particularly interested in. So a cryptographic commitment structure allows you to verify what's yours without having to necessarily download everything else from everyone else. Um, generally has a root hash, which allows you to compare two different states, you know, so I, I know for sure that my state is the same as someone else's, even if their view of the state is different from mine. One of the, the key features of Bitcoin is permissionless updates. Anyone can broadcast a transaction, uh, any miner can try to mine a block, uh, you don't need to have any kind of special keys or anything, you know, you don't need to have any passwords or you don't need to do anything like that to actually enter anything into the blockchain. Uh, and this is a key feature of, of blockchains. This is actually one of the things that makes them most useful. It makes them censorship resistant and, uh, you know, if you, if, you really, if you remove this property, really, what you end up is uh, with a really inefficient database. Uh, so this is key. And then uh, you need to be able to make sure that, you know, that what you actually have is correct and follows the rules of the protocol, uh, you know, follows the consensus rules. The key tool that we use for this is, uh, is Merkle trees. Uh, Merkle trees allow you to, to verify the state of the system without necessarily having to have all the data. Uh, you can just have the pieces that, that you want, you know, a little bit of extra just to, you know, for, to, to be able to construct the hashes. And with that, you're able to verify uh, you know, and this is a logarithmic uh, scaling thing. Um, in, the, in the Satoshi uh, simplified payment verification, uh, every single block contains a root hash for, for transactions in that block, and you can just, here the yellow dots represent um, your own transactions that you're interested in, and you're able to make, to pr you're, the, the, the SPV proofs are able to demonstrate that that transaction is in fact in that block. However, you're not able to prove that a transaction is not in a block or that you know, someone w withheld that transaction from you if you queried for it, along with all the other stuff I said that you cannot prove. So this is a really big problem. Another big problem with this approach is that you really need to scan the whole blockchain to be able to know when the first transaction occurred. You know, we wanna know, I wanna know the first time that this output got paid. Uh, there really is no way to quickly query a node and say, what's the first block that I need to download? Uh, you need to basically go, you know, all the way to the beginning and ask for these proofs. So there's structure inefficiencies, and then there's certain things that we just cannot prove. There's this whole architecture difference in, you know, the, the change in topology, which was not really accounted for. I mean, it's something that's doable. It's not something that is impossible to do. But really, the, the original white paper doesn't really consider other kinds of, of, of network architectures and topologies other than just a peer-to-peer -peer mesh network, a homogenous peer-to-peer -peer mesh network. And there's also a huge privacy issue. If you're querying something from other machines, uh, those other machines are going to know what you're interested in. So you, you might be revealing, you know, 
private information in doing that. Um, and then there's this huge issue, which I think has been very, very much, uh, you know, uh, it hasn't been spoken enough, en enough about in this uh, space, is incentives. Uh, really, right now, uh, we're relying to a large extent on altruism or on nodes that basically are, have indirect incentives to run full validation nodes that can provide these proofs to other nodes um, in order to be able to, uh, to, to, to keep the network in operation. Uh, but I think you know, one of the things that really made Bitcoin succeed in the beginning was that the incentives were properly aligned. People had an incentive to actually run nodes, um, and that grew the network. That grew the, the size of the network considerably. Um, it wasn't that you could use Bitcoin at retailers or you, know, you could trade them on exchanges. That came later. Um, the, the reason that Bitcoin was successful in the beginning was because you got paid for contributing resources to the network. And this is something that I think we really need to revive if, if we want this to, to, to grow and you know, become uh, worldwide. Because that's really something that, uh, that, that we have over any other payment processors, uh, Visa or whatever. No matter how, how hard they try, they're not going to get people to just voluntarily want to donate their computers to their network. Uh, Bitcoin did do that. And, and this is the magic of Bitcoin. So we need to fix the incentives. So as far as commitment structures, there's several different ideas that have been proposed as far as how we can improve that. Um, there's a lot of different trade-offs. Uh, I think a lot of these trade-offs are relatively small compared to you know, doing it versus not doing it. Um, this is something that we can discuss later on as far as figuring out what the best commitment structures really are. But um, for instance, one example is a uh, radix trees where this allows you to quickly query for, for any particular piece of data that you want uh, because uh, the actual data itself um, is the key. So this, this would allow you, for instance, to query for transaction outputs that you're interested in and still be able to verify by combining this idea with the Merkle tree idea. Right, so here um, you would still combine the hashes in the same way as a Merkle tree, and this would allow you to effectively make sure that all the transaction outputs that you're interested in, or any other kinds of data that you really want to query, uh, you can actually you know, quickly access and see that they are in fact part of the whole global structure. With this kind of idea, uh, we could do uh, what some have called flipping the chain, which basically means that you can query for your transaction outputs, you can query for the, for the committed state that you're interested in and make sure that these actually are part of the blockchain. And uh, this way it would allow you to have much more efficient queries and uh, would allow you to, to, to actually uh, be able to, to, to prove much more than, than you are able to do with what we have right now. Um, then you might not necessarily want to verify everything all the time. Not every node needs to verify everything. So there are certain things that we can do to at least make it possible to verify, to do some sanity checks on blocks. Uh, among these, uh, we, can, we can check limits. Uh, so we can see, we can make sure that it doesn't exceed the maximum block size, that we don't have more op counts than, than are allowed. Um, there's conservation laws that we need to enforce. So we don't want Bitcoins being created out of nowhere that uh, you know, are not block rewards nor fees. Um, we, uh, we, want, we definitely want to make sure that the, the coins that are being spent actually exist and haven't been spent before. And uh, we need to make sure that, uh, that, you know, obviously the crypto stuff works out, that transactions are properly signed, et cetera. So all these things could be checked individually uh, if we had commitment structures that allowed it. Another tool that we, that we could use, and this tool could be used for, for some of those things that I just showed, is some trees. So this allows you to verify that the total, for instance, of all the inputs or all the outputs of a block are total to, to a particular number without having to have all of them locally. Uh, you can just check your particular outputs and make sure that they are actually included in that structure without having to download the entire structure. The second thing is we, we don't really have good query mechanisms for, for, the, for the SPV stuff. Uh, right now, we have... Uh, uh, a mechanism where, where we, we can uh, you know, use filters, you can use bloom, bloom filters to ask other nodes to give us filtered blocks. Um, however, uh, this, this introduces the whole client-server architecture again. We really have no uh, solid model for, for how, this, how to approach this. So here, um, obviously, if you, if you make a query with personal info as far as like what you're interested in, other people are going to know a little bit about you. You might not want to reveal so much about yourself. Um, with Bloom filters, there's an inherent trade-off. 
Uh, you can have a lot of privacy in one extreme, which basically means you download everything. And on the other extreme, you just download what you're interested in, but then the other node knows what you're interested in. So uh, Bloom filters have a, a, a false, uh, um, false positive rate, which, which makes it so that they're a little bit more private in the sense that some of the transactions that you're going to be fed, you might actually not care about. Uh, but uh, this has several significant weaknesses um, that have been discovered, um, and I can't really get into them too much right now, but uh, there's basically a trade-off that, uh, that, that this, this is something that we, 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 uh, we haven't been able to find a way around yet. One, I one idea that, uh, that, that has come up for, that, that could possibly solve it is uh, to commit to the Bloom filters in the blocks, so then when you download a block, you can check to see whether there are any transactions that are of interest to, to you in that block, and then you can go query for those transactions, not necessarily from the same peer. So you could query transactions from a whole bunch of different peers. Uh, hopefully they're not going to collude against you. That would give you a little bit more privacy. And then the big one, incentives. Right now, verifiers, they have an incentive to make sure that they're not getting ripped off. However, a lot of people don't want to run a full node they're going to be trusting other people to verify stuff for them a lot of times. Uh, that is not the desirable situation. We would like everyone to be able to verify everything for themselves. Uh, as for provers, uh, really right now, as I said before, we're relying a lot on altruism or on people who have indirect incentives to run machines to keep the network in operation. They're not getting paid for this. Um, and, and this is something that's a really serious problem because as this number of, of nodes is reduced, uh, the smaller it gets, uh, the, the more uh, prone to censorship the network gets, the more centralization there is, um, and the more you know, the single points of failure there might be in the system. Um, and so this is a really huge problem that needs to be addressed. This is something that I believe will be possible to start addressing possibly with, with off-chain micropayments, where you're able to uh, have uh, you know, ways of querying stuff and, and actually paying small amounts uh, in efficient ways to, to be able to, to, to get that data and to incentivize people to actually run the provers, the, the, the nodes that actually construct these SPV proofs. So um, one of the things I think in Bitcoin really uh, is, is fundamental uh, is, is, is fixing the, the economic incentives. Uh, is I think if, if we're able to, to make it so that these things are, are reasonable and people are willing to do this because they are directly rewarded, uh, almost all the other problems will, will fix themselves. Um, a lot of the things that we're talking about now, especially at, at this conference, uh, are really you know, things that are, are looking to get around you know, obstacles that, that are caused because the incentives are skewed, because we don't have the proper incentives, so we need to artificially create them. But then if we create artificial incentives uh, and we externalize things and you know, like, there's no real accounting for, for who's contributing what, uh, that means that we're going to keep on having to add hack after hack after hack and it really kills the incentive for people to grow the network organically, you know, in a decentralized fashion. And, and I think that that's really the key thing that, that, that could lead to Bitcoin going mainstream. Um, so it needs to be cheap to cooperate, expensive to attack. There needs to be a way to offer resources, say, hey, I'm a node, I can do this for you. Uh, you want to do this, you know, and have a way for, for, for those that want those services to find the nodes that offer those services and a way to... Uh, you know, possibly pay them through micropayments. Um, there really shouldn't be a need for everyone to validate absolutely everything. Um, full validators right now are validating everything. Um, this is something that probably will not scale. Uh, we're going to have to find a way to either shard this or either have partial checks with, you know, some probabilistic scheme or something that, you know, we're going to have to sacrifice something in order to make it possible for there to be millions of, you know, thousands and thousands of transactions a second happening all the time. Because right now, it's, just, it's not a matter of so much of resources that no, no computer in the world can do it. It's just nobody wants to, you know, it's, it's, nobody wants to, 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 to be the one that's, it's, there's, a, there's, a, um, there's a tragedy of the commons element. You know, as, lo as long as there's one whistleblower, one person on the network that's actually an honest node, sure, the network could in principle work, but who's going to do that, right? And the fewer there are, we run into the problems we already talked about. Um, then another interesting thing is it's possible to, to either spread the risk or, you know, uh, delegate it uh, and have other people watch the blockchain for you and alert you when things happen that you're interested in. Um, these mechanisms are something that, that are currently being worked on, and I think this has a lot of promise. 
Uh, this means that you can you have a small device. You don't have to be looking at everything all the time. Um, if you can do this in a decentralized, trustless way, uh, I think this solves a lot of problems. And finally, we need scalable commitment structures. We need a way to, to have a, a consensus layer that can verify global transactions in a way that's easy to locally verify. Uh, and this is something that really needs a lot of work. I would like to see a lot more attention put into this. Uh, I think that this is, if, if we're gonna, you know, if we're gonna talk about scalability, this is probably where there's the most gains to be had of all the things that we've talked about. So um, I'd be happy to answer any questions for you. Uh, I am accessible online. If you wanna know any, if you wanna have any links or any, any other information about what I've talked about, I'd be more than happy to talk to you. I'll be here for the rest of the conference. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Eric. Okay, so we have a 10 minute break, confirmed now. So you guys can get up, stretch your legs, stretch your arms. Uh, we will come back to have our last presentation on mining, uh, on sharding, and then of course, the well-anticipated lunch. Come on people, smile, it's good to see you guys. All right. Okay, everybody's kind of like, mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Did anybody see Satoshi Nakamoto here today? Is it just me? Quick correction, uh, we have finished mining and the next topic will be block size research. So that's with Vlad, block size research, back in 10.
All right, we're getting ready to start again. Last session before lunch, block size research. All righty, righty, righty. Everybody got their coffee? Yes. All right. Scaling coffee. I like that. <laughs> Scaling coffee. How's it going, Paige? All right. You people. <laughs> you people. <laughs> Alex. There you go. All right. How's everybody doing? Warren. High five. Dude, I got to high five Warren. Jesus. Wow, this is insane. All these rock stars. I'm such a groupie. Whoa, Mr. Freedom Bach. High five. Yeah. Taj, dude, I think Satoshi is here, bro. I'm meeting everybody. I mean, all the important people. Really? Somebody? Oh, my goodness. We've got to find these people. I mean, I know Ryan Singer is on the case right now. He is checking things out, right, Ryan? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Ryan's awesome. Yes. All right, who else? Who else have I not harassed? All right, you guys know there's a no harassment rule, but I get to break it. <laughs> what are you laughing at? Yeah, yeah, what are you laughing at? <laughs> Do, have you done any presentations so far? Oh, you had a roundtable. Awesome, awesome. And are you going to do another roundtable after this? When you had one? Okay. Well, it was about being an academic, right? Because it's all theory, no data. Ooh. <laughs> Ah, oh, burn, burn, burn. All right, who else is here? Oh, Peter Todd's holding court. I don't know. I feel I want to roast Peter Todd, but everybody says you can't roast. So I don't know. I, I need a... <laughs> How many in favor of roasting Peter Todd? <laughs> Peter Todd's in favor of roasting. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> All right. I think we're going to get started. Am I missing anybody? Are there more people? I mean, everybody who's important is here. Everybody who's not, right? Where's Gavin? All right, I'm going, I'm going through. I'm going through. Hey, Jesse. Are you coming back with us? We're getting started. I don't have a camera on me. All right. So you guys can't see where I'm at because I don't have a video. But right now, there's this big meeting of folks. Wow. Camera two on me. Can I get camera two? I don't have a camera. I got. You know we're restarting. Right? I mean, no. I don't yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, there's a big meeting right now. Oh my goodness! All the wow. There's this big meeting with Gavin and and Peter and oh my goodness, all those important people. Yeah. I thought this was the most important room. Apparently, it's not. We gotta. Yeah, they're having a big uh, a big Bitcoin board meeting. You know. <laughs> I guess we do have governance. <laughs> All right, let me, let me go check with the boss man. Jeremy, what should we do? They're having a Bitcoin board meeting. Yeah, yeah, board meeting. It's like about all the brightest in minds. As Bitcoin CEO. As Bitcoin <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Should we send Warren in to get them? Uh, that sounds really good, yeah. Warren, where are you? Warren, hey man, how's it going? All right. Everybody knows Warren Tagami here? Yes. Could you please give a round of applause for Warren, please? If you, if you haven't touched the hem of Warren's jeans, you haven't really touched greatness in Bitcoin. So, Warren, we need... <laughs> we need... <laughs> I'm sorry. Bitcoin Jesus is not here, so I got to anoint somebody else. <laughs> He's still busy recovering from spending $100,000 on a web. Anyway, we won't talk about that. 
He was pricing it in 2013. Hey, Warren, we need some help. Uh, there's this big meeting outside, and they d they d they're ignoring me because I don't write code. So since you are a <laughs> maintainer, could you, <laughs> could you help get these people in here? <laughs> Because everybody here paid for, this, paid for to see me, right? I mean, I'm the most important part of the show. Yes? <laughs> Whoa, all right. Need some more victims. Let me see. Let me see. All right. So, Eric, that was a nice presentation. Slides are going to be up, right? Excellent, excellent. All right. Let me see. Uh, anybody's... Huh? Don't, if you look at me, I'm coming at you. <laughs> the trick is not to look at me. <laughs> hey, Maureen, how's it going? Really? Okay. Well, you want to say hi? Hi. Whoa. Woo! Like Fifth Element. Hello. <laughs> I'm not Ruby Rod. Okay. Who's this person here? Yeah, you're looking at me. Morgan. And what do you do, Morgan? I'm a writer. You're a writer. Who do you write for? Uh, I'm freelance. You're freelancing for whom? IEEE Spectrum. All right. IEEE Spectrum, ladies and gentlemen. Round of applause. There you go. Thank you, Morgan. Oh, my God. Is that Patrick Merck? Oh my gosh, my groupie, my groupie dar is going off. Oh, hey, hey, Patrick. Hi. Hello, Patrick. Hello, Tariq. What's happening, bro? Uh, this is a great conference, and the MC is just spectacular. Really? Is that why they're having that meeting in the other room? Because they don't want me around? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Patrick. All right. Um, I'm not sure what we're going to do, but I think we're just going to get started. Because we're here to make this, make this, take the show on the road. Vlad, are you here? Okay, hold on a second now. Vladi. All right. So this is the first uh, presentation out of the research section. Uh, everybody, please give a round of applause for Vlad Zamfir, who will be presenting. Thank you, Vlad. It's going to be awesome. Hey everyone, I guess you can hear me all right. Sweet. So today I'm going to talk to you guys about blockchain sharding. Uh, this is the class of blockchain solutions, of chart of scaling solutions that I like the most. Um, so that's why I'm, and I've done the most work on it out of all those scaling solutions that I've done research on. Uh, by the way, in case you don't know who I am, I've, I'm a researcher. Mostly, I work for the Ethereum project. Um, so let's get started. Basically, the basics of sharding is that in a non-sharded blockchain, every node processes every transaction and holds the entire state. Whereas in a sharding solution, um, nodes will process a subset of the transactions and hold a subset of the state. And the state here, we mean like unspent transaction outputs, right? Um, and basically, instead of everyone redundantly doing the same work, we're going to try to like share the load, but still be a, have some economic assurance that everyone else is doing a good job, even though we're not actually validating every transaction. So it is a bit complicated. Uh, I'm going to give you a high level overview of this type of protocol uh, without filling in all the details, because the details would take too long. But basically, we can get orders of magnitude more, more transactions per second if not everyone is doing everything. Um, that should be pretty intuitive. And the nice thing is that we have a very similar trust model to the uh, blockchain-based like you know, authentication from the Genesis block using proof of work. Uh, we don't have like trust models that are based on the nature of the transaction. It's all just proof of work from the Genesis block. So again, more trans more orders of magnitude, more transactions per second, same trust model. So there's a pretty clear appeal, appeal there, I think. So there's basically um, challenges to sharding the blockchain. One of them is that we need to assign miners to, to shards uh, so that miners from one shard don't migrate to the other in order to produce invalid blocks over there. Uh, and so to do that, we need to sample the mining power. And so that, that, pre that presents a challenge. We need to split the spa state space into shards. We need to process transactions within and between shards. And then we need to deal with all the different attack vectors uh, that exist in this type of solution where not everyone's checking everything. And so there might be something amiss if a block is in a shard, but it's produced by a like, majority of Byzantine nodes. So the first thing we need to do is, again, sample the mining power. Um, basically, we can do it, but it means changing the block header. The key to doing this is non-outsourceable proof of work. Non-outsourceable proof of work 
basically is proof of work where the private key from the Coinbase has to be on the machine that produced the proof of work. So the easiest way to think about this is if you were required to sign the nonce before, uh, in the block header. So then it wouldn't just be that the Coinbase you know, can have a private key that the mining pool has. You actually have to have the private key on your hardware in order to sign the nonce every time you change it. So this, re this represents a change to the block structure and, uh, and uh, will require basically in order to do a smooth transitions like backwards compatible ASICs that everyone switches to after uh, enough people have these ASICs that are able to sign for non source will work. And basically um, it, it lets you estimate the mining power of various holders because based on the amount of work that they produce with their Coinbase, um, you can bound their uh, mining power below. So you know that they don't have uh, m less mining power than they claim they do using the proofs of work. And basically, um, so there's this, we have to have a way to estimate these. Um, we can have like this kind of tree chain approach where anyone can mine at different parts of the chain and people with more hash power mark will, will mine at the top of the tree and less hash power mine at the bottom of the tree so everyone can get their shares in and we can get a picture of which Coinbases have how much of the, of the hashing power. And then basically, um, the amount of hashing power that you can use in this non sourceable system will be bounded by this estimate of your hashing power. Uh, because that way you can't pretend that you have less hashing power than you do and then bring a huge amount of hashing power online onto a shard in order to overwhelm it. So basically, again, we first we need to estimate the mining power of all these miners, and then we need to sample them and assign them to shards. So again, this is really important because otherwise, so if we have a shard that's secured by 2% of the mining power, any Byzantine 3% could go over there and produce invalid blocks. So we need to sec securely sample the hash rate and then assign it to the shards. So basically, this is, might be kind of what it looks like. You go and you, everyone has their Coinbase and signs their nonce and you get shares and we can see basically, have an estimate of how much, how much hash power everyone has. And then we can, uh, and then switching to like a easier to understand dr drawing and doing a little bit of fault tolerance analysis. Honest. Um, then if you, if you, you basically uh, sp split up the pie into lots of little slices and then, and then randomly reorder the slices and sample them, the, the larger the number of slices you have, the, more, the higher the probability that you have of, of having a majority of correct nodes in any given shard. So with, just from uh, fault tolerance analysis, if we have enough s slices of the pie, we can make more shards. So more slices of pie, we can make more shards securely in the sense that we have a very, very high probability of a majority of Byzantine, sorry, a majority of correct nodes being on every shard. And again, that's important because if a majority of Byzantine nodes are on a shard, they'll produce invalid blocks and then other miners on other shards might not be aware of that right away. So, and then basically we can do like a cumulative binomial distribution to see what the probability is of getting any one shard having, uh, or having more than half Byzantine. And so we can like make sure that we have a very low probability of that when we place the samples of mining power into the shards. And then we need to shard the UTXO space. Uh, luckily in Bitcoin, um, it's pretty easy to see if two, tra if two UTXOs, if transactions can be processed in, in in parallel or not, it basically depends on whether or not they spend the same UTXO, at least from a given UTXO state. If they spend the same UTXO, then they need to be, the only one of them can get in. If they spend different ones, you can process them concurrently. So basically, we're just going to split the, UT the UTXO space into like mutually exclusive sets. Um, and basically, we're going to insist that transactions uh, that spend inputs from shard I are mined by the miners we place in shard I. So basically, there's going to be transactions that they process that from their shard to their shard, and there's going to be transactions they process from their shard to other shards. But they needed to only check whether the spending is valid. And then they make the outputs available to other miners, including the proof of work, which will basically serve as an economic proof that the, trans that the outputs were spent correctly. And basically, um, the blocks have uh, uh, so basically, there's there's two there's two levels of blocks. There's like the top level blocks that like uh, it deals with the estimating of people's mining power and assigning them to shards, and there's low level blocks that are produced in every shard. 
in order to spend these outputs. And then like everyone will be a light client where all our shards are not validating. They'll check the work, but they won't process the transactions. Uh, and so basically, and these headers will have, the, the headers of the shards will have like Merkle roots uh, for, the, for the UTXO state changes, ideally. We can talk more about that later. Um, and then basically, um, they will group together trying outputs that are going to different shards so that they can pass it to those miners from that shard so that they can update their UTXO set to include these new outputs. So basically, again, we estimate the mining power of Coinbase's, we sample the Coinbase's to the shards, we, uh, and we split up the, the UTXOs, uh, and then we, uh, we validate the work on the low-level blocks, and we validate the transactions on the blocks that we are assigned to as an individual miner. Uh, but this is, sorry, uh, on, so on the top level block, we just, it's just SPV of all the low level blocks. And here's a little drawing. So here we have the top level block, and then basically in the transaction, so the place where transactions would normally go, we have block headers for the different shards. And those, those block headers have groups of transactions for the transactions that are uh, for, from the shard to the same shard, from the shard to shard, the other shards, so that we can basically keep track and pass the, pass the outputs around between the shards so that everyone can happily move their outputs around in order to spend them. Additionally, I didn't mention this, but I should have, uh, the transaction has to spend inputs from the same shard. That's important, because that way there's a particular set of miners that you assign your transaction to. If you're, if you're spending inputs from multiple shards, then multiple miners from multiple shards would have to see it. Um, so basically the question is, okay, how much does this actually give us? Um, and hopefully you're kind of convinced that it's secure from a Byzantine fault tolerance analysis point of view. Um, and basically, so we have uh, this top level chain, which in the more overhead we add there, we can, in, we can add more shards. So uh, it, the number of shards is l linear in the overhead of the, uh, of the top level chain. So basically, um, so if we assume that like half of a node's processing and bandwidth capacity is going to uh, validating the top level chain and half is going to processing transactions on the shard, then a uh, linear increase will increase the, linear increase in, the, in everyone's like computational power if we increase the block sizes will lead to uh, a linear increase in the number of shards and a linear increase in the transactions per shard. So that means that basically we have an order of n squared number of transactions where n is like the number of computational resources that, an, any, that like the minimum powerful node has. Whereas like now with when every node does every transaction then we get on the order of n because, if, uh, because every node needs to keep up and so you're limited by the weakest node whereas here you're limited by O of n squared of the weakest node. So this is a significant improvement in the number of transactions per second that we can do. Um, basically because it becomes super linear instead of linear in the computational power of any given node. So increasing the block size has a bigger effect in a sharding solution than in a non-sharding solution because we get this O of n squared instead of this O of n increase. Just to illustrate this, basically, uh, if we increase the, the, the computational power, so the, the, the beige color represents the overhead for checking the top level chain, and then the different colors represent the overhead for, for checking the char shards. Um, if, we, if we increase the amount of computational power, the, the top level shard can keep track of more, the top level chain can keep track of more shards. So we add another shard and um, we get another, you know, uh, a linear increase in the number of transactions per second that we can do because we've added another shard. Uh, and also the shards get longer because the, we've assumed that, you know, that we, so we, we would insist that we spend half of the time uh, validating the block header, the top level one, and then half the time processing transactions. So we get this, this square increase in the number of transactions that we can do when we increase the capacity of any individual node. And then there's basically security problems, as you could imagine. Um, well, the one, one, one problem is like people might crawl up outputs all into one of the, one of the shards uh, because we give them the option to move them because they need to spend them together from a shard. Um, and then basically, it, on every shard, you're gonna have an independent market for transaction fees. And if people crawl lots of outputs into a shard, then it'll be expensive to spend transactions there. And so you will move outputs out in response to people's corralling transactions in. Um, so that's like the way to deal with that. Uh, invalid blocks uh, is another problem where basically a miner will produce an invalid block in a shard and then 
if we don't find out about it, uh, other people will process transactions on outputs from that chart, from that, from that block. Uh, and this is especially bad in uh, economic analysis rather than Byzantine fault tolerance analysis, because in economic analysis, you can just convince all, um, you know, all of the rational nodes in the shard to go with it uh, on the fly after they're sampled. Whereas in fault tolerance analysis, you kind of have to have them be faulty ahead of time before the sampling. Um, and then basically what we can do is um, there, there are challenge response protocols that really cleanly deal with this because if you mine an invalid block um, and someone challenges you, they can get your block reward if it turns out that you're invalid, that your block was invalid. And if people don't agree as to whether or not it's valid or not, then there's a big incentive for people to find out, download that block and verify it uh, because they will gain from this market of where, where people are betting whether it's invalid or not by betting on the right side. A much harder problem though is to deal with unavailable blocks where you don't know if the block is invalid or not but uh, it's, you just can't find it. And, uh, and there, are, there are challenge response protocols here where basically uh, you, you, you want to show that this, this data is unavailable but you can't do that because you can't prove that the data is unavailable. Uh, but what you definitely won't do is build a block on top of their block if you can't find it. Because uh, if you build a block on top of an invalid block, that's an invalid block, and then you won't, won't get your, uh, your block reward. Um, so there are ways to deal with that as well. So basically, um, this has gone a lot quicker than I thought, I think. Uh, but basically, so that some of the takeaways are that we can, we can do uh, more transactions per second without changing the trust model. We still will basically count the total work from the Genesis block, only instead of just looking at the header uh, on the top level chain, we'll add up the work from the headers on the, on the shards as well. Um, so it's, this, it's the same trust model. Okay, the work is not outsourceable, uh, and we need to do this in order to sample and assign miners to shards. Uh, and the protocol is complex, especially once we ta start talking about these challenge response protocols and the betting to deal with basically what I call escalation. Like what if something goes wrong on one shard? Then we need to have more attention be there. Um, and uh, so it is, a bit, it is a bit complex. Another thing that uh, I should mention is that if you find a block to be invalid, then that block needs to be reverted, and so do the blocks that spend outputs that that block sent. Um, so, so, so there could be a good amount of block reversions as a result of finding one invalid block. So it's, imp so it's very important that we find it and then that we re revert the transaction because it might lead to a reversion of blocks from other shards, not just the shard that you're in. Um, so basically, you know, I'm wondering if you know, sharding is the future of the Bitcoin blockchain. I don't know. Um, and I hope that you guys maybe will have an opinion uh, and that you'll talk to me about it. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Vlad. It's awesome. Okay, next presenter, Mr. Mark Friedenbach. Um, dude, I love Freycoin. That was some good stuff. Yeah, I'm a fan. All right, alternatives to a block size limit as a rate limiter for validator resource consumption for consideration. I just chewed that. Wow. All right. Mark, everybody, round of applause. Thanks. Thank you, and uh, I want to also uh, start by making a shout out to the people who organized this conference, Pindar Wong and Jeremy. Uh, thank you so much for putting this on on short notice. I think it has been extremely helpful, and I hope that uh, the next one in Hong Kong can be as well. So uh, I'm giving a talk on block size here, but we're not going to be talking about any specific proposals, rather talking about the general idea of a block size limit. Why do we have it, and is it even a good thing to have in the first place? Uh, so the block size, as you all know, exists as a denial of service limiter. Um, it rate limits the amount of uh, computational resources that a, that a node validating the blockchain can uh, exhaust at any time while validating a block. Um, and the reason why we want to do this is because we are, uh, in, in the early days of Bitcoin, there was a great concern that um, by authoring certain kinds of transactions, you could significantly slow down a, uh, a validator. Uh, just by broadcasting these or mining a block with some really weird non-standard transaction in it um, or just filling it up with tons of spam. Um, and as we've seen in all the, com all the talks uh, both today and yesterday, there are a number of ways where uh, if you could increase the validation cost of a node, 
you could gain an advantage as a miner. And so there's great centralizing pressure that comes from being able to deny, deny service to the network in this way. Um, so it, it, there's also, I should say, also a, a engineering concern here as well. Um, when there was originally no uh, block size limit, it was all still the case that you could not create a block more than 32 megabytes because that was the maximum message size. Um, so at some point there has to be some engineering consideration involved in what uh, the maximum block size is just so that we're able to test software. Um, and uh, there are a few other ag aggregate limits in the Bitcoin code base for a block. Um, in particular, there's a limit on the number of SIG ops that can be contained in a script pub key. Um, yeah, but these are all rel d derived directly uh, from the maximum block size. So some problems do emerge. Um, in practice, it's observed on typical blocks that uh, the block size does correlate very well with the uh, number of, with the validation time um, of the block. But that doesn't always happen when people purposely are messing around with it. Um, you can construct blocks that require lots more time to validate than your typical block, even though you're coming in under the block size limit. Um, and I'm gonna give some examples of actual blocks that are on the blockchain that you can look at and analyze. Um, and uh, the, the core issue here is if we're creating a system that wants to be trustless, that we want to work under a variety of circumstances without any gated access to it, we need to be designing for the worst case scenario. We need to be assured that if miners have an incentive to create slow blocks to validate, that they are not able to generate blocks that are much, 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 much worse than, than what is typically seen on the network. Um, and so when we say that you know the block limit is whatever you want it to be, one megabyte, 32 megabytes, a gigabyte, um, you want to be the case that your typical one megabyte, 32 megabyte, whatever block is in fact the maximum, uh, has the maximum um, resource utilization that one can expect. Um, so how bad is it? Let's take a look. Uh, there was a, there was a uh, block consisting of one transaction of, other than the Coinbase that was broadcast about a month ago, um, which was F2Pool doing a wonderful thing for the community and cleaning up a bunch of spam on the blockchain. The only problem is it turns out this block takes 30 seconds to validate even on a beefy computer. And why does this happen? This happens because um, it is one giant transaction that's about 999 kilobytes and it contains about 5,500 uh, signature operations. Each of these signature operations serializes the entire one megabyte transaction out. Um, it does some work on it first in memory, moving buffers around, serializes it out, and then hashes, resulting in about you know, one and a quarter gigabytes of data being serialized and hashed. And the Bitcoin serializer is not fast. That's actually where about 60% of the, uh, the validation time was, at least on my node. Um, so 30 seconds to, to validate, and that's on a beefy computer. I, I don't have numbers on what that is on a Raspberry Pi, but I imagine it is quite long. Um, and most importantly, this is not linear scaling. This is quadratic scaling. So it takes only a 3.2 megabyte block limit uh, for, to get to 10 minute uh, validation times. And if you're doing eight megabytes, we're talking two hours and eight minutes. Now that said, you know, if Gavin is in this room, there's a couple of different ways that he has proposed that, that this could be fixed, and it actually, uh, such a transaction um, would, would be considered non-standard on the network now. Um, so it's pretty much only miners generating it that would be a concern. Um, but it, it uh, illustrates an underlying issue, which is that some problems we have with transaction size um, scale quadratically and not linearly. Um, one of the proposed solutions to this is the limit size of a transaction to 100 kilobytes, which is fine until we start talking about, you know, what if we wanted to add CT, you know, confidential transactions, to the Bitcoin mainnet. These require, uh, you know, 100 or, uh, to a couple, I mean, one or two uh, kilobytes per, per uh, confidential output. And so it massively increases the size of a transaction and your average transaction with a couple of inputs and outputs might end up running up against the limit that is put in place. So it's, it's a concern that doesn't really have a, 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 an exact solution at this point in time if we're measuring things by block size. Um, additionally, in 2013, um, Sergio um, discovered a vulnerability, which was uh, tagged with a number I think is on there, um, having to do with the max block SIG ops. This was a limit that was put in place to protect the network. Um, it says that a block can't have more than a certain number of uh, more than a certain number of check SIGs in its script pub keys. 
Um, and that number is, I believe, 20,000 with a one megabyte block. Basically, take the block size, divide by 50. Um, and it, it, it's very sensible until you realize that it is not the outputs that are executed in block validation, it's the inputs, and those are completely unmetered. So it is very simple to create. With some lead time, you can create a bunch of transactions that spend, uh, you know, uh, Sergio did some numbers. You can create a single output that does a 200 check sigs. Um, and then it is extremely simple on the, on the uh, attack block to just reference that output, and you automatically add 200 check sigs. And if you do this with a giant transaction, you combine it with the last one, you can create a block that takes an extremely long time to validate. And so he, uh, Sergio did the numbers. It, there's a trade-off here in terms of how many SIG ops you're doing versus how large the transaction you want, because uh, the more SIG ops you add, the, the smaller the transaction is. But most of the time is spent doing the serializing and hashing. And he was able to construct one that, in theory, would be about three minutes to verify. And that those numbers haven't really changed today, since that's mostly hashing, which in, as opposed to database operations. So all of the scalability improvements that we've had doesn't, didn't really apply. It's probably still take three minutes to validate such a block. Now, thankfully, um, uh, such, uh, such transactions are non-standard. You can't broadcast, if you broadcast them to the network, they'd probably be ignored. But um, this is a vulnerability we still have. Um, finally, we have uh, UTXO set growth um, being greatly affected by, by user action. This is a graph of the last, uh, the last three months from Statoshi, um, and it, has, uh, it, it, it illustrates um, a couple of different stress tests that have run, been run in the, in the last couple of days, I mean, last couple of months. And um, the, the red line there indicates the, the point of the first stress test, which grew the UTXO set size from around 650 megabytes up to about 850. So a massive increase at relatively little cost to the people who are running this. And those UTXO outputs, um, some of them were spent, most of them still on the chain. And for the most part, um, they're clogging up uh, the database that is used by Bitcoin to validate blocks. So they're making every block afterward slower. So how bad is it? It's pretty darn bad. Um, uh, if you're trying to engineer a block to validate as slowly as possible, you can get it by these bit fast numbers I just showed you to be somewhere between 10 and 100 times um, slower than a typical block. So your average one megabyte block, you may make an argument that you know our, our, our Bitcoin nodes are able to support it just fine. Um, but if you're looking at the worst case, you take what your, your node can do for one megabyte block, takes a couple seconds to validate, or hopefully less than a second on a fast computer, um, multiply that by 50 to 100, and that's what you should be engineering for if you're using the block size limit, um, uh, if you're using block size as your limiter. Um, furthermore, these attacks are relatively cheap. Um, as we've seen with the stress tests that have gone on. Um, it ha uh, if it was one stress test, maybe, maybe I would think it was a fluke, but so far there have been, I think, three, and uh, they don't seem to be stopping. And in each one of these cases, we see this quadratic scaling due to the size of the transactions. Um, and again, like, these, are, these are not theoretical. They're observed in the wild. Um, so the, the, the question is, if we're creating, if we're, if we're thinking about proposals for scaling Bitcoin, why, is, why then are we are using the block size as a measure for resource utilization? Why are we talking about raising the block size? Perhaps we should be thinking about using something other than block size, using a more direct uh, measurement of the resource consumption of a block. So what, what affects full validation? Well, block size is still on that list, and the reason why it's on that list is worst case latency for transmission. Um, we've, so we've had a couple talks here about various network coding schemes like IBLT, um, these have the capacity, or in the Bitcoin Relay Network, which has the capacity to fit a block within a single TCP packet, um, minimizing latency effects, no matter the block size, sort of. Um, and uh, that's a good thing, but that's assuming minor cooperation. So with IBLT or related schemes, you can create a block of just about any size, and as long as you create it in such a way that you're using transactions the network knows about, uh, you can get your, your latency down. However, if you're thinking adversarially in your, and you want, to, uh, you want to maximize the amount of propagation delay for your blocks because it gives you some advantage, then it is trivially simple to create spam that was unbroadcast before your block was found and include that. So the maximum block size does in fact impact full validation. But we have other factors here as well that we're concerned about. Um, I had shown that UTXO set size. Um, and Patrick had given a talk earlier about uh, the, the uh, time to do initial block download. There's a related 
calculation you can do, which is if we're if we don't want to grow the UTXO size by more than a certain amount per year, you know, how large of a block uh, do we want to support, given some assumptions about how much UTXO is created versus spent in a given block. Um, and when we're looking at script, we have the SIG op limits. Um, these, uh, there's also a, f a couple of other um, operations in the script language which are not constant time. Um, for example, duplication. Uh, you can create a couple. Of, you can create some large. Um, uh, you can you can create uh, large items on the stack and then duplicate them many times. There are, there are ways that this can be protected against, such as preventing opdupe from creating super large, uh, uh, creating um, too large of a. Uh, an item on the stack um, and just rejecting the transaction. But um, it, it does exist there as a, as a memory usage. So if you want to drive up, like one transaction uses a couple megabytes of, of memory or something like that, it's, it's fairly doable. Um, the libscript, which is our library that handles the Bitcoin script uh, execution engine, um, does not at this time track a lot of information about which opcodes are being used and how many of them um, how much data was, I mean, how much memory space was required, but this could be done. Um, and so it'd be a little slight refactoring to get a little bit more insight into what va uh, what resource usage is made by LibScript, and even perhaps to get rid of memory allocation in there entirely, and it just, you, you tell it, okay, this script is gonna take, you know, one and a half megabytes, here's a chunk of one and a half megabytes that you use to validate. Um, but th those are some refactoring changes we could make, and so then we could have as a input into this metric, whatever it is, the opcode count uh, executed and space requirements and such. Um, elliptic curve operations, these are check SIGs. These are relatively expensive to run on a CPU. They're usually not hardware accelerated. Um, and uh, right now we are measuring those in outputs, which is, as I said, stupid. There's no reason we should be doing that. We should be measuring inputs, and so that's a change that we can make. Um, and uh, finally, when we saw with the F2 pool thing uh, block, uh, we have this issue of um, our blocks being slowed down by the amount of data that is being hashed. So if we just checked or aggregated and accumulated um, how many bytes were hashed in every step along the way in validating a block, um, and then use that as a limit, that would also help uh, prevent things like the F2 pool um, block. So that's a lot of different parameters in there, and you, there's an infinite variety of functions that you could use to, um, to combine these together into a single metric. Um, but the reality, and I would encourage anyone who wants to look at it to consider different functions, there might be a better one. But the reality is that for a lot of engineering reasons, a linear combination makes sense. So just a linear function with coefficients on each of those parameters, summing up to some number that you use as a metric instead. Um, and the reasons for this are, are fairly mundane. It's simply that um, the existing system right now is a linear function of one parameter, block size, and so it's pretty much a drop-in replacement to have a much more complicated but still linear function. Um, it, and it, it also has the nice advantage that your uh, coin selection algorithm is, remains a, a, a simple knapsack algorithm, not a multidimensional one, which is not, does not have straightforward solutions. So uh, a, a linear combination of factors would be a drop-in replacement that you could use in pretty much any, any wallet software. Um, but some of these coefficients are not like the others. So, you know, if you're thinking about, okay, how much, how many single opcode um, executions are, are equal to one round of SHA-256 or something like that, you can just measure that and figure it out and decide, and decide fairly well, because you're comparing CPU running time. But um, how many bytes of RAM equals 100 milliseconds of CPU utilization? Well, that's, that's a little bit more variable, and, and in fact, it changes over time as computer hardware evolves at different speeds. Um, and some of them are kind of intangible. For example, we are, um, we are uh, kind of not, it's kind of arbitrary how you compare growth of the UTXO set size to how, how costly it was to validate a transaction. So there's a little bit of room for future work there in figuring out exactly how, um, exactly how that should be combined together. Mark? I know I'm about done. So there's a summary time. that I pretty much said, and I want to thank you all. Um, there's going to be an extension of this work presented at the Hong Kong workshop if it's approved by the committee. Um, so I hope to see you all there, and uh, thank you so much. Thank you. All right. And now, next presenter, Mr. Jeff Garzek, and he will be presenting on uh, 
issues impacting block size proposals. Please, a hearty round of applause for Jeff Garzik, BIP 100. I'm BIP 102. Thanks. Check, check, check. Though uh, I think we're not allowed to actually say the words BIP 100, so <laughs> we, we might have to fire you as MC. Um, Jeff Garzik, done thing in space systems. I also do Bitcoin Core Dev for BitPay. And uh, this is really sort of a laundry list of issues impacting block size proposals. It is uh, not a uh, comprehensive analysis into one specific issue, but uh, many of the issues that are uh, looked at as, uh, I look at uh, uh, the next workshop as sort of output, looking at, uh, to generate proposals. This is input, input into some of those proposals. So a moment of history. Um, Bitcoin was introduced as a P2P electronic cash payment system. That's uh, what it says in the white paper and that's what most of the users uh, initially were exposed to. The one megabyte block size is already covered was set for anti-spam purposes. Uh, otherwise when Bitcoin's value is low it's trivial to uh, DOS the network with large blocks. So. Uh, moving on to some observations, um, the process of finding distributed consensus takes time, therefore by definition Bitcoin is a settlement system. It settles on a stable timeline of transactions. Uh, the core service that it provides in my view is censorship resistance. If you don't have censorship resistance, you don't have a stable timeline, you don't have a uh, permissionless entry and exit into the system. So. That censorship resistance, in turn, comes from the large network of decentralized validators, nodes, et cetera. So average block size for all time is uh, uh, pretty much what that graph shows. Uh, we started to grow in mid-2012, and uh, you can see in 2015, uh, we started to uh, burst up towards uh, one megabyte, but in general, uh, we see that blocks are, on average, not full. Um, block size provides DOS protection. That raises the cost of attack. Sort of a history, um, 250K soft limit existed until uh, about December 2013 when it was bumped in the source code 0.8.6 to 350K, then the soft limit was raised again to uh, 750K in March of 2014. And you can actually see this on the block size graphs if you, uh, I didn't have a, a two year graph, but you can see pretty much exactly where Bitcoin went from 250K to 350K and on up. And that really shows that a lot of people just run Bitcoin core with the defaults themselves. Um, the trend is pretty clear that we're headed towards the one megabyte hard limit, but as mentioned, blocks are not full today. You know, that's caveated, we're excluding uh, long blocks that take a long time for the network to find, and therefore more transactions build up, and that ex excludes uh, artificial stress tests. So today, blocks aren't full. Observations about the fee market. Um, we've essentially had, for the history of Bitcoin, mostly zero-fee competition. Um, again, that's caveated. You have uh, network events where you have long blocks that get full, uh, traffic bursts, stress tests, and uh, they're right before uh, the uh, soft limits were bumped, you would have short periods where uh, there would be a little bit of fee competition, then it'd disappear. But on the long-run average, so far, users have experienced essentially zero fee competition. The fee floor is set instead not by fee competition, but by the anti-dust, the anti-spam relay limit, which is encoded into Bitcoin Core. So essentially, you cannot get your transaction relayed unless you have this minimum fee set. And the miners, on the other hand, they're, you know, as, as miners power is, Welcome to mine any block at any, uh, or any transaction at any fee level. But uh, in practice, what matters is that fee floor set by the default Bitcoin core, which is uh, uh, essentially 
leaving out dust. Um, fees provide near zero economic signaling today. For users, it's incredibly difficult to reason. You have no idea when you're sending one Bitcoin whether your transaction is going to be a small in terms of byte size or large in terms of byte size. The value is not in any way correlated to the byte size of the transaction, and the byte size of the transaction is what the fee is based on. And so it's incredibly difficult to reason, and then furthermore, you might have a block that appears in a minute, it might, uh, the next block might take 30 minutes, et cetera, and so they don't really have a good way to judge, am I going to pay fee X to get behavior Y? Because in the short term, the blocks are essentially unpredictable. So they're difficult to reason on the user side. On the miner side, pretty much the same way. Fees are unpredictable. Um, you can uh, ramp your soft limit all the way up to uh, one megabyte to maximize uh, however much fees you get. But essentially, economically, the uh, fees are dwarfed by the 25 Bitcoin subsidy. And so it's just sort of noise, it's change to uh, the miner, and it doesn't necessarily change their behavior uh, through economic signaling. They can't uh, uh, you know, perform some behavior which suddenly makes them more profitable. It's entirely dependent upon what traffic appears on the network. Uh, more observations, and the, like I said, this presentation is basically a laundry list. Um, no, a non-contentious hard fork, um, I view as a uh, useful check and balance and a user voting mechanism. Hard forks in general should be hard, and they should be rare, but I don't think that they should be impossible. Bitcoin uh, was built to be upgraded. Uh, a natural equilibrium block size exists in absence of the limit. This is uh, a bit of a uh, controversial statement, and I'm happy to uh, expand on that after the session. But essentially, there are several incentives outside of simply maximizing fees, which will prevent miners from building large blocks, even in the presence of today's uh, miner relay network, et cetera. Um, another observation, which a lot of people miss, is that there is rapid miner and mining pool turnover year over year. And so the market share for mining pools uh, radically changes month to month, year to year. And uh, similarly, we have people uh, who are generating the hashes, and that changes from year to year as well. And so, uh, you know, what, who is the king today is not necessarily going to be the king six months from now, a year from now, et cetera. And so that rapid turnover actually works against centralization because we have permissionless minor entry. Anyone can, uh, assuming you can uh, design a SHA chip and go to TMSC or another foundry and get chips, et cetera, Anyone can mine at any time. There's no uh, permission, there's no notifying anyone else, you just turn it on. So uh, moving on to some problems. Um, there's a wall at one megabyte. Um, if we hit that wall at one megabyte, if blocks are consistently full on average at one megabyte, then that is a major economic policy shift to active fee competition. Now, the, as, as the previous slides mentioned, that is different from the entirety of Bitcoin's history where there has been basically zero fee competition. And so from the user experience side, that is a radical change. Um, the user's market software are not prepared for this. Um, the user experience rapidly degrades once blocks are consistently full. Um, though, helpfully, the uh, stress tests, the uh, spam, on the network did force some wallets to uh, improve their fee behavior. So, uh, you know, out of, out of annoyance, there is good. Um, the wallet one megabyte creates a lot of market chaos as fees shift to a new, new higher equilibrium. And uh, notably, this event is uh, event driven, not time driven. And so uh, we might hit that condition even before uh, the next workshop, for example. Um, and when we hit that wall, we have a problem where businesses, users are incentivized away from Bitcoin by high fees. Uh, more problems at a high level, if you get uh, stuck at one megabyte, as in we are, uh, fail to come to any sort of consensus at all, and it's incredibly difficult to uh, figure out where to go from there, and we just sort of sit at one megabyte and never hard fork away, 
that strangles Bitcoin growth and adoption. Another problem at a very, very high level is what I call the uh, fidelity problem. Is uh, Fidelity is one of many, many Wall Street, et cetera, companies looking at uh, doing some Bitcoin experiments. And uh, they, like many, many others, uh, they say, well, if I just flip the on switch with this beta program, I instantly max out Bitcoin's capacity. So that, number one, makes the, the project a non-starter from the get-go. If you're sitting there at one megabyte, business plans never get turned on, projects never get started, and that growth that you would hope to measure through observation in a block size never appears. So you get sort of a chicken and an egg problem where people don't want to increase block size until traffic is there, but people don't want to put the traffic there until there's some reasonable uh, guarantee or hope that the Bitcoin bandwidth will increase. So that becomes the problem of, you know, no user and traffic growth, if you build on it, then the block size problem sort of solves itself and, uh, you know, we all go work on Ethereum. Um, <laughs> Problem, more problems at a high level. Uh, Bitcoin was built to be upgraded, so we shouldn't be stuck at version one. Uh, the protocol uh, is upgradable through soft forks as well as hard forks. Soft forks are arguably uh, both easier and a little bit more uh, uh, insidious in that they only require the miners to upgrade. They don't require any sort of user uh, approval whatsoever. Um, there is uh, no good way in general to measure community opinion on block size. What if the, the vast majority of uh, uh, Bitcoin users want to stay at one megabyte? What if they want to go to 10 megabytes, et cetera? Um, there's no, no good way to vote, no good way to uh, figure out uh, their collective opinion and then move on consensus from there. Um, that's a duplicated point. Um, uh, another problem that I see in a lot of analysis is not thinking about the user and market experience. There's uh, uh, various proposals, including an older one of mine, where you have, for example, a, uh, a static jump in the block size or a static fall in the block size. And what that does is essentially reboots the fee market from scratch. And so from a market disruption and chaos standpoint, that's uh, quite bad. Um, not thinking about the user and market experience in another sense is if we do nothing, as mentioned in the previous slides, a fee market will appear abruptly at the one megabyte blocks full consistently mark. Users are not informed about this, are not prepared for this new economic policy. And so it uh, is essentially just sort of foisted upon them uh, a, a, in surprise. And uh, sort of as an example of really not thinking about users in the market is there was a uh, proposal on uh, GitHub to uh, you know, restore the minimum fee rate to 10,000 Satoshis. And not getting into that specific proposal at all, but what in effect this does is that raises the minimum price to use the network once that is fully uh, deployed in the uh, default implementation. Good or bad, that's the net effect. And so you can't just say, well, I'm going to raise prices on everyone in Bitcoin, please uh, merge this. Um, there needs to be a lot more uh, introspection and thinking about the user experience. Fee market specifically, there's a market uh, disruption upon the shift to blocks full on average. Even worse than that uh, is if you're going from today's state of not full to a full state, and then we bump to two megabytes, that's essentially rebooting the fee market twice. So you achieve a state where the fee market is active when blocks are full, you bump the increase, and then no, there's no longer block pressure. And so, again, from a market perspective, it's just radical, volatile disruption. Um, as mentioned, there's uh, zero fee competition. That's potentially a moral hazard in that is it sustainable long term? Right now, uh, users essentially have low fees because the subsidy is economically much larger than the block fees. How long can that continue? And it is a valid economic choice to do that. Even though it's potentially unsustainable long term, it's quite natural to say, well, we want to subsidize adoption today 
and bring people onto the system. So that's a rational economic choice that many people can make. Um, as uh, outlined by uh, many previous presenters, uh, the limit increase has costs. Um, there are a, a large number of them not listed here. This is just sort of a large summary. Hard fork required. A, um, you know, a caveat is there is uh, one proposal by uh, Adam Back which doesn't require it, but uh, most of the others do require a hard fork. Um, larger blocks potentially push miners and nodes off the system. System security may be impacted and increased network load is shouldered by an ever fewer number of actors. Uh, more problems to avoid in block size proposals. Avoid uh, high priests, otherwise known as core devs, choosing magic values. I believe that this should be transitioned to the free market and uh, to uh, uh, a little bit more active uh, uh, role in that free market. Avoid user cliffs, that this is what I mentioned previously, where you might have a jump from one megabyte to two megabytes. Um, that is a large market change, which produces large market disruption. Um, on the uh, slightly more technical side, the Bitcoin core needs to uh, send out blocks a little bit, uh, a little bit more smartly, in that right now it just sends out to every connection that requests it blocks at the same time when a smarter algorithm would be a little bit more like BitTorrent and choke some of the connections, unchoke some of the connections, and you have a more optimal uh, block sending uh, system for the main network. This is not talking about the uh, minor relay network. Um, another problem with this problem space in general is that you have centralization on the low end and the high end. And so it's uh, a range that we need to find in the middle what is the good value. On the low end, centralization pushes people to centralized websites once block space and uh, fees demand it. And on the high end, the, you only have a few nodes that can process it and you've essentially reinvented the Visa data center. And so we have to figure out where in the middle we are going to get. And another key problem in general is a lack of data and field experience on, mark, on block size changes. Um, another observation, the community likes safety rails, uh, uh, notably uh, sort of a, a floor and a ceiling, that sort of thing on block size. Um, simulations only go so far. Simulations are always uh, not, the, not reality maybe stating the obvious, but uh, field experience is potentially gained by a small change and then gather data, obser observe, et cetera. Um, speaking of simulations, these are some of the variables, uh, not all of them obviously, that I've been running in some of my local simulations. Just trying to get a, an idea for uh, if you scale up the block size and then full nodes come down, prune nodes increase, et cetera, uh, what are the network resource costs, the CPU costs, et cetera? Um, another thing I see is sort of analysis errors, analysis of block size proposals. Um, a lot of this is uh, uh, discounting or not seeing externalities. And uh, for example, uh, that's uh, where you might say, well, uh, this miner is uh, always going to maximize for fees, and that may potentially be quite erroneous because a miner might have a private contract with a, co a company to, uh, for a fixed fee, uh, publish all their zero fee transactions. Um, miners uh, uh, must be profitable in the short term. That's an analysis error. There's obviously debt-fueled uh, miners, equity-fueled miners, et cetera. Um, miners uh, quite often and quite rationally look at the uh, they're long Bitcoin and they look at, uh, even if I'm uh, losing in the short term, long term Bitcoin's value will increase and I will make a profit in the long term. And so there are a lot of simplistic evaluations on minor profitability that I, I call uh, sort of microscopic analysis. It's not really looking at the macro. And then uh, uh, another analysis error is the possibility of selfish mining implies a broken system is that you can find quite a few individually selfish mining examples or incentives, but collectively they all break down, is fundamentally once you have, and that, that's true with today's block size, that's been true throughout 
Bitcoin's history is if 100% of the miners or even uh, uh, you know, greater than 50% are selfish, then Bitcoin's value diminishes greatly. So there, there are some, un, you know, some subtle incentives that uh, keep things going and uh, some people are uh, missing that in their analysis. Some more observations about uh, potential changes. Uh, you, know, you have a static one-time increase in the block size problem, you need more forks later. Um, if there's a static increase schedule, the uh, increase might be too big for uh, what the system needs or it might be too small. That uh, doesn't really take into account the uh, free market needs. Uh, Feedback-based uh, type systems, those reflect the market but are potentially gameable and uh, manipulated by uh, someone who is just sort of buying a bigger block size, uh, et cetera. Um, Another uh, potentially very interesting uh, uh, incentive-aligned proposal that uh, appeared, I, th I think it originated with Minnie Rosenfeld, I could be wrong, is uh, pay to future miner, where you have, uh, you insert a transaction that uh, pays not to you, but it pays to some future miner, and so that in that's a random selection process at that point, and it uh, nicely aligns incentives. In contrast, pay with difficulty, uh, scrambles the incentives because there's a lot of opportunity cost in uh, either waiting for a longer block to make it bigger and uh, giving up the opportunity cost of someone else finding a block before you, etc. You wind up having to either collude or potentially uh, lose much more than you would gain by an increased block size. Jeff? Uh, time? We're, we're out of time. Uh-oh. <laughs> All right, let me, let me speed through it. 60 uh, more seconds. You Let him speak. Thumbs, thumbs up. Okay. <laughs> uh, second course correction, hard fuck, hard, hard fuck, no. Uh, That's it, all right, all right, thank you very much. <laughs> Jeff Garzik, ladies and gentlemen. You uh, want to finish the last thought? Yeah, yeah. Let, go for it. I'll go, go real it. quick. Uh, <laughs> a course correction hard fork is likely. Don't plan, don't engineer too far in the future. Um, all the world's coffees will not fit on the blockchain. You have to have layer two as well as uh, increasing this and all the other scalability issues. Um, and that's it, thank you. Thank you, Jeff, awesome, excellent. All right, speeding right along is Alex Petrov uh, from Bitfury kicking off the uh, mathematical formalism for voting process. Please welcome Alex. Check, check, check. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. So my name is Alex Petrov. I'm representing Bitfury Group, and uh, I will represent you mathematical formulas for a voting process, uh, which is, was made by our analytics teams. Uh, they are working really hard, and uh, if you check our website, I already get a lot of feedbacks about the uh, previous uh, reports what they are, uh, and research, what they are publishing. Uh, so let's go back for mathematical formalism. So a voting process uh, for choosing the block size is a very critical thing. So uh, they are trying to keep the democracy and uh, we are respecting all the votes what was paid for a block size. But right now, we think there is a lot of problems was hidden inside that. So uh, there is different approaches uh, reaching the consensus in the de decentralized environment in the Bitcoin. So the current problems what existing in the voting, uh, voting models uh, is uh, presented uh, voting. So not all the votes are taken into the account. So some of the votes are given extra preliminary weight and uh, theoretically we allow uh, X percent attack on the voting process. So parameters for voting process also not always grounded. So these basic things practically corrupting the uh, democracy in the choosing the block size. Uh, the votes are not counted correctly and the playing the statistics and votes, practically ignoring parts of the votes, are broken the process. So what they are suggesting, they are suggesting the better algorithm 
and a better model, uh, which allowed to count all the words, uh, count the algorithmically more transparent, more understandable way, and uh, it's more simple computation methods. It's take all the words into consideration, and uh, it's also respect all the words. So it's maximize all the voter satisfaction in the voting results. So if we would like to reach the maximal uh, satisfaction in the voting results, so we should define the uh, opposite part. So we should define the mathematical define dissatisfaction. So what is dissatisfaction? So dissatisfaction uh, is the sum value which defining how you are dissatisfied if you're voting for a block size, for example, one megabyte, but in result it was choice in uh, block size like two megabytes or four megabytes. So if you just formalize that in the maths, and uh, if you just use mathematical symbols, try to uh, describe that reality, because sometimes mathematical is better covering the uh, reality instead, instead of many, many words. So then the uh, satisfaction, what they're getting in results, is practically the summary of all the weights of all the words for all the block size. And uh, that formula uh, will practically uh, define all the satisfaction in the summary. So uh, let's take the example. So we can choose the two different types of a satisfaction function. So the absolute difference between what uh, on the target or relative difference. So the absolute difference between the words in the target, uh, let's take, for example, we are voting for one uh, megabyte block size. So if you are getting in result one megabyte block size, you are satisfied. So if you are taking two megabytes, you are like minus one satisfied. So if you are taking three, so four and five, you are less satisfied. So in results, we can also define it by a simple formula. So choosing for one megabyte block size, it's a summary of all the words. And uh, the result is uh, mathematical representative in some numbers. So if you are talking about a real a relative difference, so it's also uh, the same representative, but they, they are talking about the person. So if you are talking uh, about the choosing, the, for example, two megabytes block size, so it's a summary of all results, and if in result uh, it will be chosen one megabyte uh, block size, so you're not satisfied. If three megabyte, you're also less satisfied. So uh, about choosing the block size and about the satisfaction, uh, we are a little bit more clear, but we should also provide the correction. So comparing to real world, if they are uh, paying our votes, choosing the one person, so you can choose only the one person. But if you are talking the block size, we have better flexibility because we, we are able to choose not the one megabyte block size, we can choose one and 5.5 megabyte block size or 2.8 megabyte block size. And these provide a little bit of flexibility. So we can hit the result keeping in count all the voices and choosing the better affordable solution for everyone. So sure, we should keep also in mind that we have also margins on the both sides. Someone can vote for very, very small block size. Someone can pay votes uh, choosing the very big uh, block size. And uh, the result should be somewhere in the middle. So counting all the voices, and let's take for example, we have uh, uh, distribution for a block size, like one megabyte block size taking weight 21%, two megabyte block size taking 25%, uh, four, 25, and eight, 29. So then uh, choosing the different alphas, we can uh, squeeze, screw, screw results, and uh, practically make the little bit information to choose the better results, which will be more affordable. Playing which alpha, we also can uh, hit the target at the lowest value or at the biggest or highest values. So 
In result, if they are choosing uh, the alpha like one, so the what result will be uh, 4.03 megabyte in size. So if I'm uh, taking 0 0.5, so the result will uh, be 3.25. So if I'm choosing 0 0.25, so it will be 2.59 uh, and so on. So uh, quadratic dissatisfaction uh, is uh, one of the simplest way, but uh, we can also take the exponential dissatisfaction uh, function. So uh, comparing to a quadratic function, exponential function uh, is uh, infinitely and continuously uh, more differentiable. However, optimization task uh, will require more complex computation uh, in the algorithmic implementation. So the same example of what's distribution, and uh, you can see how the alpha uh, impacting the block size in the result. So uh, practically, I cover everything. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. If you'd like to get the more results, or if you would like to see more calculation, I have a couple of slides that I can provide you additionally. So we just the representative of all calculations from the previous slides. The copy of this slide you can also download from Scaling Bitcoin, uh, Bitcoin uh, website. It's also available uh, in the Dropbox, and you can also download it from our uh, bitfree.org uh, site in Research uh, Separate menu. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alex. And our final presentation before lunchtime. Okay, uh, Harry is coming up to present how Bitcoin, how will Bitcoin block size affect non-currency applications? Please give it up for Harry. Thank you, and lunch after, all right. I can feel the energy. I think we should bring back Jeff. <laughs> uh, I'll just give him my mic. Treated well. <laughs> Ooh, got the big mic. Alrighty. Um, so, hey, I'm uh, Harry Kalodner. I'm from Princeton University, and I'm here today to uh, talk a little bit about the uh, scalability, scalability issues that non-currency applications of Bitcoin have that might be a little different than kind of regular payments that go through the Bitcoin network. Uh, and this is a talk I put together with my advisor, Arvin Ryan on. Um, and, and kind of my, my reason that I wanted to talk about this was that when people talk about kind of how Bitcoin will have to scale in the future, one of, like, one of the favorite things people throw out is, oh, well, Visa processes 4,000 transactions per second, and so we need to worry about, about scaling issues like that. But uh, I just want to point out that uh, there are other kind of relevant factors. Um, so I just want to start by going through a few interesting applications of Bitcoin that could in the future lead to huge amounts of increased use in Bitcoin. Uh, so First off, uh, domain name management. One, one really cool uh, altcoin, which I've looked at before, uses, uh, uses UTXOs to represent domain names, which can then have associated values in order to fully decentralize DNS. And uh, this involves storing both the, value, the names associated with tokens and then also including 
DNS records essentially on the blockchain. And this is done currently on an altcoin, but it also works just as well on, on Bitcoin itself. Um, and we can see that Namecoin, when I, when I looked at Namecoin initially, it had, we were, we were looking at about 120,000 domain names on it, which I thought was a pretty large number and substantial usage. But if you compare that to the ICANN domain name system with 294 million domains, that would mean 294 million UTXOs in the pool just dedicated to domains themselves. And so trying to support an application like that would, would pose some really interesting challenges. Uh, next up would be stock trading. And there's certainly a lot of substantial interest here. Uh, we have NASDAQ currently processes about 10 million trades a day. Uh, New York Stock Exchange has three and a half million. And so this is the sort of application where you could see kind of a lot of daily usage going through. They're already, we already have the technology to, and, and the ability to do these on the blockchain as it, is, uh, as it is. And there are various ways to scale this application. But uh, there's definitely some substantial demand there. Um, regular uh, stock trading currently, there's a three-day settlement period after a trade before the uh, actual money is exchanged. And so it, using the blockchain, I mean, there, there are various reasons for the settlement period, but uh, certainly one of them would be ease of, of and security of transactions, which Bitcoin solves very well. Um, and then finally, just a, a third example would be uh, well, smart property in general. And uh, for, for example, uh, car ownership, it would be perfectly feasible today, although difficult and, and unscalable, to uh, have a car which actually had access to the blockchain and was connected to and owned by a specific UTXO and, uh, and could sign, a, transaction, tr sign a, a message to the car in order to unlock your car and uh, use an atomic trade to uh, sell your car for Bitcoin and, uh, and, and transfer ownership to somebody else. And so, uh, and, and you could just as well uh, own and sell houses doing the same thing and unlock your front door. So there's certainly smart property has, uh, has a lot of uh, applicability in the future. And, uh, and there you go, I mean, 245 million cars in the US. So this is uh, yet another example of, uh, of a massive load on the system if you had mass adoption. Um, so how, how do, what do all these applications have in common and, and how do they work and, and why do they pose kind of interesting problems? Well, they, they all involve, and, and this is any way you do them, and, and talk about a few different options, associating extra information with uh, specific outputs, that they, that they have special application semantics, which are encoded in transactions, and which to everybody else means nothing, but which to people who use that application defines very special, uh, very special meaning to particular outputs. And there are a number of different systems that, uh, that use this method. The, uh, the kind of most, sim most simple and straightforward one and, and kind of most on blockchain is colored coins. Um, and, and there you have all information about the colored coin system being available in transactions. Everything you, can, you, everything you know about the system, everything you gain from the system is stored right on the blockchain. And, uh, and there's some other protocols like counterparty, which uh, operate with the kind of quite different system, but operate in the same way of storing all necessary information on the blockchain. Next up, we have Blockstore, which is an interesting compromise. So in Blockstore, Blockstore does, uh, turn, turns the blockchain essentially into a, a key value database. But the insight there is that you don't really want to load the blockchain up with all of the value data. You may want to include arbitrary large values, and so what they do is that instead of loading, putting the value in the blockchain, they put a hash of the value and then use a distributed hash table off chain in order to actually store the values. And as a, uh, as a associated optimization technique, whatever you'd like to call it, they actually support updating the distributed hash table, updating the, uh, the value associated without actually putting anything on the blockchain by just signing the new value with the, with the same key which owns the name on the blockchain. And so that's one way of offloading some data from the blockchain while maintaining the ability to, uh, to use the application. But uh, this, this is, doesn't really help scalability too much since uh, the, in order to uh, register a name, it unfortunately takes two transactions in order to prevent a practice called front running where a miner could say, oh, hey, 
that's a name that I want. I should just register, my, I should just register that myself rather than uh, letting somebody else do it. And so if you were trying to use this to, uh, for instance, register the same number of users as Twitter, it would take 732 million transactions just to get the system set up, which is kind of a, an unbelievable number. And uh, finally, kind of most separated from the blockchain, you have, from the Bitcoin blockchain, you have the opportunity to use these systems on altcoins. And, and, and there, we've kind of completely removed the load on, on the Bitcoin blockchain. We say, all right, this, this data has no place really with uh, loading up the blockchain. And so we're going to move these applications aside. Uh, but altcoins have a lot of problems. They're responsible for their own security, which means that you can't really trust them. We, it's, it's very difficult to, to provide an altcoin that actually is, a, is anywhere near on the level of security as Bitcoin has. You, uh, you, we have merge mining, which purports to partially solve the problem. But unfortunately, merge mining has the problem that unless 50% of Bitcoin miners are trustworthy, are trustworthy in mining on this altcoin, then the rest of the Bitcoin miners could easily just attack it, uh, which is a very well-known concern. And they also have the problem of fragmenting the ecosystem. So, rather, so, so it's a lot more difficult to sell people on having to use 10 different altcoins for 10 different applications than it is to just have Bitcoin, which has name recognition and, uh, and, and awareness already with it. And sidechains would, partially, would certainly do, go a long way towards solving that problem. So a, a, a fully merged mind and, and sidechain would at least kind of provide the potential for, for a good method for offloading a non-currency non application from Bitcoin. Uh, and, and now I want to get into kind of why specifically I think these are worth mentioning as, uh, as, as, as applications of Bitcoin, as uses of Bitcoin. So there are a number of scaling solutions that, that, we're talking, that we've talked about. And, and the solutions that I'm particularly interested in are the solutions which cause Bitcoin to require fewer transactions. That, that scaling issues become, become, scaling becomes an issue when you have too many people who want to post too many transactions on the blockchain. And so one really nice way of handling that is to reduce the number of transactions that are required. Uh, but these, these, those solutions that, that work on that line have an inability to really deal with a lot of the applications that I'm talking about. Requiring higher fees is nice, but a lot of these applications that I've talked about, like domains, really require there to be low fees because the, they're just not worth enough. And, and so it would be really unfortunate to lose those due to a high fee market. Uh, then you have off-chain transactions through exchanges. I mean, when you, if you uh, have your wallet with Coinbase now and you want to send money to another Coinbase user, the, your transaction, there's not even going to be a transaction on the blockchain. They're just going to flip a couple numbers in their database because they control all that data. A lot of it is not reality on the blockchain. Um, and then you have the Lightning Network, where we can, we can not require that more transactions actually show up on the blockchain because they are being sent through micropayment channels that are already open. Uh, but unfortunately, a lot, the, the, especially the, the second two solutions, uh, going through exchanges and using the Lightning Network, depend in a large part on the, on the fungibility of Bitcoins. When you use the Lightning Network, the, the Bitcoins that you send out or, or the colored coins that you send out are not the same coins that the person you're sending to receives. And so the Lightning Network can work quite well for, thing, for applications like stock trading, where as long as you can relay through a, re a, a connection that has the ownership over the same stocks, it will be perfectly well supported. But it will never work for something like car ownership or domain names where you're really dealing with assets which are completely unique and where fundamentally there has to be a transaction on the blockchain in order to, to update their status. Um, so takeaways from this talk, why, why did I think that, that this was worth talking about? Well, non-currency applications are, are really primed for an, uh, for an explosion. I think that, that some of these applications could be a huge draw for users to Bitcoin. And these are the sort of applications that, that could have extreme network effects for kind of building up and, and having large people going and, and, I mean, look how quickly Facebook blew up when, when that started getting popular. Um, and, and because these applications are, are relevant and, and could grow large, 
I just think it's important that when we're discussing scalability solutions, we think about this, the specific implications of, of these applications. So thanks for your time. Thank you, Harry. All right, everyone. Okay, so how's everybody feeling right now? Woo! Are you hungry? Hungry? I, okay, if you're not hungry, I can't let you go for lunch. So you got to let me know how you're feeling right now. Are you hungry? Yeah. I don't like this side. This side, are you hungry? Yeah. Wait, hold on. I, are you hungry? Yeah. Great. Let's go for lunch. I will see you guys after this for uh, Christopher Negroponte's presentation. Lunch, uh, we should be back here by 2.10, okay? Nicholas Negroponte, after lunch. Let's do it. Thank you.